and this has been done in the last 10 years. And I'm going to talk about work that I've done. And I've had a lot of volunteers help me with this as well. But uh, so we'll go to the next, let's see, next slide here. Okay. All right. So what, what is the Armenian Immigration Project? What I've done is I've, I've tried to figure out a way to gather data to help us understand the immigration of Armenians to North America. And by that, I mainly mean the United States and Canada from about the mid 1800s through 1930. Okay, so this is gonna be a lot of the families that came uh, and individuals that came before the genocide. And then the ones that came after World War I ended for about that first decade. It's not gonna have a lot uh, for those of you who came from uh, Armenia, uh, maybe in the 60s and 70s. But uh, the way I've approached this thing is I've tried to go through primary American sources, US and Canada, relating to Armenian immigrants. And those primary sources include nine different types of sources. I started with ship manifests, then moved on to things like censuses, birth, marriage, and death records, military draft registrations, naturalization applications, passports. And then recently I added newspaper advertisements, which are the missing persons ads from 1919, 1920, 1921 um, from, from Armenian newspapers. So what I've done is I've taken the data um, and I've put it into a centralized index, which is available on the internet for free. Uh, and I'm gonna give you the links to that. And then we're gonna show you how, actually how to get in there and search for records. And what I've done, which I think is really the best part of this is I've linked these different records together. So you can click on an individual, find their ship manifest and there may be more than one entry for that person uh, because they may have come multiple times. So it will show all the times they came and then it'll find every other occurrence of a record for that individual. Let's say they came in 1900, uh, 1905, uh, we'll show where they were in the 1910, 20, 30, 40 censuses. We'll show what their military draft registration looked like. If they applied for a passport or naturalization, we might even have their photograph in there. So that's really what I did. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about what the primary sources are, why I picked the different ones and the value of each of these primary sources. My page down button isn't working. So, uh, so, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about uh, the project itself, what the different primary sources are then we're going to talk about the database itself. And I've got two types of uh, things there, reports and queries. I'll talk about what those are. And then we'll do a live demo. And in the middle of this, we can do question and answer as we go through. OK, so uh, you know why is this important? Because Armenian genealogical research is, research is tough. Um, and as many of you who've tried to do this kind of research have learned, uh, the records uh, that are from historic Armenia, which comprises a lot of the Ottoman, Russian, and Persian empires, is either lost or inaccessible. We're starting to uncover some of those records right now, but for the most part, it's very difficult to get to those. And even if you can get to those, there aren't a lot of people who can read uh, you know, Ottoman script and Russian and, and Persian and things like that. Uh, and there are some of us diaspora Armenians like myself who don't speak or read Armenian either. So um, what I found is that um, there's a lot of great information on this side of the pond in the American records that helps us learn ab about um, our family members who came during that time frame, even though we don't have access to some of those other records. Uh, I started asking questions about this to my relatives in the early 1970s. And, um, some of them were willing to talk about it. Other ones did not really want to talk about it. So that, that was one of the challenges. Um, some of them were very young when the genocide happened. So they had very little memory of the family members that were there. The records that are available are very fragmentary. There really is, when I started this, there was really nobody who had done really a systematic collection of the Armenian uh, sources in America or elsewhere. And now we're starting to see some action uh, uh, in uh, places like France, where they're starting to pull the same kind of a thing together. 
Um, again, there aren't a lot of Armenians in the diaspora who can read uh, Ottoman Turkish. A lot of you can read Armenian. I cannot. Um, and, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges. Uh, a lot of the records in the U.S. and Canada are now online, but the challenge uh, we've had with a lot of the records, it's very difficult to find people because every record you look at, the name is spelled differently. I'm sure most of you have run into that with your own names. Okay, um, so how did I get started with this? Um, my paternal grandfather, Dikron Arslanian, came from Erzurum in 1906. Uh, he settled in the Pacific Northwest, uh, married a French Canadian woman. They ended up in Fresno, California. He had seven children. He died in 1965. My own father, one of his kids, was estranged from him, so I never did meet my grandfather. So I was always kind of, and, I, and I'm one fourth Armenian. So my other uh, three fourths are Western European, German, English, and French, French Canadian. Uh, so I always had this interest in my Armenian family, but my dad really was not interested in it because he was estranged from his father and really didn't have any information. Uh, but what he did is he put me in touch with, this was like 1971, he put me in touch with some of his cousins who were much older than him, who were genocide survivors. My dad was born in 28, but these, these cousins were born in the 1890s and the 19, uh, between 1900 and 1910. And uh, so what I did is I sent these, I was 14 at the time, and I put together questionnaires because they lived all over the country. And I sent them these questionnaires and they fill out these questionnaires and three or four days later, I'd get a letter in the mail where they answered all my questions. And then I would generate more questions and I filled that, created another questionnaire and I sent it to these, these were all older gentlemen and they responded back. And so we had this correspondence going back and forth between, I was in California at the time and one of them lived, a couple of these guys lived in uh, um, Detroit, Kansas City, Missouri, and another one lived in Liverpool, England. And during the next few years, these gentlemen just responded back and forth, sent me some charts, answered a lot of my questions. And uh, it was really a, a very nice thing for them to do for a 14-year-old boy at the time who had this interest. And that's really how I got started. But back in those days, um, the only thing you can get your hands on was the U.S. Census microfilms. So um, in 1971, the last census that was available was the 1880 census. So that really didn't do me much good since my family, most of them came here between 1900 and 1915. So uh, I kind of put my research on the shelf for a while. Um, and then um, at one point I read a book by Robert Miroc, uh, who's I think he's still living, called Torn Between Two Lands, Armenians in America, 1890 to World War I. And I thought it was a fascinating book because he was talking about the immigration experience of, of uh, people like my own family, these Armenians who came here prior to, to World War I. And then th at that time, um, the uh, Ellis Island Ship Manifest uh, started to uh, become available. And uh, so, what I started doing, this was 2001, is I went to the Ellis Island website and I started abstracting the uh, ship manifest entries for immigrants from the part of Armenia that my grandfather was from. Hopefully I could learn more, you know, find his ship manifest, find some ship manifest for these individuals I was corresponding with. And I created a big spreadsheet of about 2,700 ship manifest entries for Armenians from this, uh, Part of the part of Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, and uh, I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. And uh, then in 2005, Family Tree DNA started this thing called the the uh, Family Tree DNA, uh, where you could order Y chromosome DNA and compare your DNA and try to find relatives. So I started this thing called the Armenian DNA Project in 2005. I was kit number one, um, and uh, in 2000, but I, I think I only found about maybe 20, 25 people. And then Peter Reshdakian in, in 2009 approached me and said, can we expand this to Armenians regardless of where they were from? And I said, hey, that's a great idea. So uh, Peter took it and uh, along with Hovan, Simonian and a few other folks has expanded it now to about 2,500 people. And I've kind of stepped back from the operational management of this thing and Peter and Hovan and 
a few other folks who have joined it since then have, have carried on with this. Um, and then in 2011, I decided, hey, you know, this really is interesting what I was doing with the immigrants from my grandfather's district, but uh, I, I really wanted to start looking at Armenians from wherever, the, wherever they came from into a US or, or a Canada. So I started uh, going back to that research I did about 11 years earlier and created these massive spreadsheets of Armenians that uh, regardless of where they came from, if they came through Ellis Island, uh, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, a bunch of these other ports, uh, and then I started creating these large spreadsheets and I decided I would uh, kind of stop my um, research to those folks that came about 1930, uh, just because I didn't want to boil, boil the ocean, but uh, then I started uh, looking at that and I started cre realizing that there was some great information in some other sources like the uh, census records and some of the uh, birth, marriage, death registers, uh, graph registrations and things like that. So I started creating all these different spreadsheets. And um, at some point I realized that putting a spreadsheet out there on the internet, a PDF of a spreadsheet with 25,000 rows was kind of tedious and you, it was very tough to find things. So then I uh, uh, found a way to uh, create a website, which is based on a MySQL database, uh, where you can actually go in there and search a lot of different ways. You can sort, sort through it on the, on the website. And uh, then eventually I learned to tie all these different records together so you could click on one place and find everything that I, that I found on a particular individual. So what you see today uh, really came into being about four to five years ago and we'll go into that uh, demo in depth. Okay, so what are the, some of the questions you can answer with the American sources? You know, everything on this side of the pond. Uh, these are just some of the types of things. You know, how did they come to America? How'd they, how'd they get here? What port did they come through? Where were they going from? Who were they leaving? Who were they, who were they joining? Um, finding what village they came from. Uh, lots of times these records just say, I said I came from Armenia or I came from Turkey or I came from Russia. Um, but eventually you'll find something that says what town or village they came from, which might be just a tiny place with only a few hundred individuals. And then after they got here, where did they live? You know, who did they marry? Who were their children? Uh, who were the relatives and friends? What did they look like? Uh, a lot of, I've got about 2,500 photographs of these individuals that I've found from various places that are, that I've attached to the records that they serve in the military. And what I was surprised about is a lot of these people, especially the men travel back and forth multiple times. Some of these people travel back three, four, five times. So all of these kinds of information you can find in the American sources. And then some guys like uh, George uh, Agjian and a few others are now starting to uncover records in some of the Ottoman sources and, and other parts of the Middle East uh, and uh, Greece and Egypt and some places like that that ties in with a lot of this stuff. So uh, we're really learning a lot more about these families, but the way we have to start is by looking at these primary sources. And so I'm gonna <clears throat> talk a lot about what a primary source is why a primary source is of value and what uh, is unique about the different kinds of primary sources. And then we'll, we'll go into the demo. So um, if, if any of you haven't joined the Armenian Genealogy Group on Facebook, I recommend highly that you do that. It's a private group. Uh, when you put in your join request, uh, we'll ask you a few questions um, about abiding by the, some of the team rules. We try to make this very focused on genealogy. It's not a cultural site. It's not a site for political uh, stuff, uh, current events. It's really focused more on genealogy. But uh, we started out um, <clears throat> about four years ago. I was asked to join when they had about 200 members. Um, and now we have about, about 12,000 members. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you are probably already in this group, but uh, if not, I recommend, highly recommend that you join because there are a lot of people in the group that have uh, expertise in various areas. These people are from all over the world and they're very helpful if you're trying to find out more about your own family. 
So I'm going to pause now and just ask if there are any questions before I move on to the next part of the presentation. Uh, I am curious with your father, um, did he become interested as you became interested or he just had no interest in, in learning about his history? He was very interested in assimilating as a young man. He lived in Fresno, California. He said there was a lot of prejudice against those, the Armenians there. And he wanted to be more like the quote unquote white kids in his high school class. And so he really didn't have much interest in his Armenian background. Um, he died in 2009 at age 80, and probably the last five years is when he really started to get a lot more interested with what I was doing. But uh, during that early early time when I was getting started on this as a teenager, he, no, he really didn't have much interest, which made it tough for me just because I didn't really have anybody who I could ask these questions of because my grandfather was no longer living at that time. Right. I mean, I have a lot of respect for what you did. Um, I mean, what about his siblings? Did they feel the same way? They were all born in the United States uh, between 1918 and 1934. And uh, their father had, and mother had divorced when they were young kids. And again, they really didn't have much interest in that. Um, the older ones probably had more of an interest than the younger ones did. But uh, they really were not a part of the Armenian community there growing up very much, even though they lived in Old Town Fresno for a while. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question, Mark. Yeah. What, at what point in your family did someone shorten the day, name to Arslan? <laughs> okay, my dad was one of seven kids, five boys and two girls. Of the five boys, they go by four different last names. Wow. Okay. My dad and his oldest brother dropped the IAN when they became young adults before I was born. Um, one of the brothers went by Arslanian. Uh, another one was a boxer, a professional boxer for a while, and he went by Lion, L-I-O-N, which is the, what Arslan means, in our, and it's a Turkish word meaning lion, the animal. And then my other uncle was uh, kind of on the run from the law for decades, and he's got about seven or eight different names, and we have no idea where he even ended up. So yeah, we have number of different last names. My cousins all go by different last names. But that's just kind of the way it's always been for us, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> There's lions. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, when, when you collected all of your information, is it all digital? The information is uh, text in a database. Um, I do not have links to the images themselves, but every single record I have, I have a citation where you can go to family treat or familysearch.org or ancestry.com and find anything I've got out there. The only exception to that is the missing persons ads where I actually do have a, a clip of the ad itself, which is which is all in Armenian. And I've pulled out the name, the place names and personal names and dates and things like that. But everything else, I do not have linked to the original record, but you should be able to find it. If you can't, just let me know and I'll help you find it. Great. Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, there's a number of different, different reasons why I decided not to do that, but uh, probably the main reason was time. Great, yeah. well, thank you. You seem to have done a lot of research. Uh, it's, it's really amazing uh, all the work you put into it. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks very much. It's It's been a real passion of mine. And uh, what I've learned through the Armenian genealogy group on Facebook is there are a number of other people who are equally as passionate about it. So I've got uh, probably about 20, 25 people who have helped me with this thing. And uh, some of them, uh, it's just amazing what they've contributed in terms of their time and uh, expertise. Okay, let's move on to the next one and I'll pause in about another 15 minutes for some more questions. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi, I'm Saucy. Uh, and hi. I have, uh, filled in the survey uh, this afternoon and forwarded it to you. Mm -hmm. um, th first of all, thank you for spending time with us and letting us know about the availability of these resources and thank mm -hmm. you very much for your work. Yeah, uh, well. A lot of people uh, would appreciate it. In my case, uh, I had said that uh, I know I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. I came here, so I know my uh, grand 
parents and all that. I don't have a genealogy problem issue, mm -hmm. but uh, my grand my maternal grandfather was uh, a, a, in the U.S. Army during the First World War, and I've okay. been trying to get a, get a service record just to have it in the family. I have a picture of him in his uniform, soldier mm -hmm. uniform with his you know rifle and all that. Um, I have uh, years, few years back, I wrote to the army, uh, I think on the website, and they sent me a form to fill, but I don't know the name of the ship. I don't know exactly which date he came. Is there uh, any way I could go uh, and access manifests of uh, those couple of years, ships that came from Europe to New York? Yeah, if, if he uh, was in World War One as, as a soldier, he that means he probably got here before 1918 and probably arrived a few years before that. And the ship manifest that I uh, abstracted cover the years from maybe 1848, I think was the earliest one I had. And I've got some through the early 1930s. And I think I've probably captured about half of the ones that, that half of the arrivals during that time period. I've got, let's see, 67,452 ship manifest entries. And I, I think there were probably between 125 uh -huh. and 150,000 entries. So there's probably a 50% chance I've got them in there. Um, if not, if you can't find them, just send me an email uh, and I will uh, be happy to look for you. And, and, and that's really what I do a lot is a lot of time people will send me an email or put something on a Facebook group saying, uh, you know, I know my family came sometime in this time period, but I haven't been able to find their ship manifest or I haven't been able to find them on the census. Please, I, lo I love it when people say, you know, here's what I know about them. Can you help me find a ship manifest? Okay, uh, wonderful. I'd be, I'd be happy to help you find that. Great, and how can I get your email uh, to the Facebook? Um, I think it's on. I think it's on the front page of this presentation. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, it, and it and if if you go to my uh, home page for my project, which I'll show you, it's got my email address on there as well. Okay, great. But uh, should the army be able to uh, draw out his uh, service record just by having his name and World War One? Um, the Army should be able to provide you with that. Uh, some of those records are available on Ancestry.com. Uh, it's probably more likely you'll find him on a, a draft registration card, uh, which, are, which are, are very well indexed. But uh, send me an email and I'll see if I can help you find that. Wonderful. God bless you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to proceed on and I'll stop a little bit for some more questions. Okay, so um, I started out with ship manifests, um, started out with Ellis Island, then I realized there were about a dozen other ports accepting uh, arrivals during that time period in both the United States and Canada. Um, so then I started uh, adding some of these other types of records. Um, so on the ship manifest, I have this thing called an immigrant ID. So every, every arrival has a unique ID. And then when I find that person on a census record, a death record, and one of these other things, and I can find their ship manifest entry, then I point to that immigrant ID. And what I've done there is I've been able to link all these different records together. So if you can find uh, your person in one of these records in my database, and I have found their ship manifest entry, uh, when you click on that person's ship manifest record, it'll show every, every other place I found that person. And some of these people came to America, let's say 1905, 1910, and then they brought a bunch of their family members and friends over from, from their hometown in the old country. And they might've had 10 people who listed them as their sponsor when they came over. And by looking at those names and the relationships, you can learn a lot about that person and their extended family. So that's really the key to this is trying to start with something like a ship manifest entry, which before 1900 are kind of boring because they really don't have much information in them. But when you start supplementing them with all these other kinds of records, then you get a much better picture of that person. And literally we uh, can get photographs from things like naturalization records, passports, or just your family photo albums. Awesome. And uh, so linking all these records together, that's the thing to keep in mind is, is that's the value of this. So I, I, I call that the holistic view where you can take an individual mm -hmm. and by look, looking at all these different records, you can find out how they got to America, who did they join, who did they leave in the old country, 
which may which in many cases was a wife uh, who they intended to go back to and were sending money home to before the genocide, uh, where they went after their arrival, uh, who did they marry you know, after, after after the war was over if their wife didn't survive, uh, did they have children, did, were they in the military, did they go back to the old country? So all of these kinds of things are in the American records, U.S. and Canada records, and in some cases, we can actually find a photo of that person that as early as 1915 in these records. So I call that the holistic view, but you get that by tying all these different records together. And then you also learn about that immigrants network, you know, their family members, friends, um, different people maybe they work for. And lots of times we have pointers back to the names of their parents, uh, brothers, sisters in the old country, and uh, so you learn, you, you can start out with one person and you might get 10 or 15 people that are attached to that person somehow, either families or friends. Uh, lots of times we can find maiden names of their mothers. We can find married names of their, of their, of their uh, sisters. We can find people who never came to America, but they're mentioned in these records. And then every one of those people we link them to has their own network. So by stepping through these different links in my database, you know, you can spend an hour just traversing somebody's network. You know, you, you look at all the people they're connected to, and then you say, gee, uh, I see he had a brother that came over five years earlier than him. So you go to his brother's record and he has this whole new set of people that he's connected to. And so you can continue through this, this network and find all kinds of things about your family uh, <clears throat> that you never would have found out just by looking at something like a ship manifest. Is there a question there? Okay. Pardon me? French Canadian lady had seven children, his father one of them, then his father married. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of uh, good information you can get by linking these records together. So it provides a much more complete picture. Uh, you can learn a lot about uh, where they came from, uh, dates and places of birth, marriage, and I'm going to talk about birth dates, which is kind of an interesting thing, um, which I didn't realize. Um, some of these things, when they came from a little village somewhere, you may have to find five, ten records about that person, actually find one record that mentions the name of the village. Uh, and learning about place names and, and uh, administrative structure within the Ottoman Empire, you know, what their equivalents of states and counties and things like that is very important when you're doing the research. So we're going to spend some time talking about that later on. The interrelationships are very, very interesting, finding out who they're connected to both in the United States, uh, the old country and elsewhere in uh, the diaspora. Um, the, the other thing that, that really frustrated me when I started with this is every record I saw would have information that seemed to conflict with an earlier record. I'm sure those of you who've done this get very frustrated that, you know, why does the birth name or birthplace differ from a ship manifest versus their uh, draft registration or a passport application? And why, if, if you find 10 different records, why do they show five different birth dates? Uh, and this is very, very normal. And, uh, you know, after a while, you kind of get over it and realize this is just kind of the way it is. But um, by looking at 10, 15 records about that one individual, you might start seeing, uh, be able to corroborate some of those dates or places. Uh, and other times you may just have to throw up your hands and say, we really don't know for sure exactly when they were born, but you know, it's one of these, you know, it's this range of maybe a five year period. But by looking at different records, you can, you can maybe say with confidence, yeah, here's where they were born, but other times uh, you might not be able to do that. Okay, so you know why? So why is this? And I and I listed a number, but number of different reasons why the information is either incorrect or inconsistent. Um, and I think probably the most likely reason is the informant, whoever was providing the information, may not really have known that information. I think a lot of these people who were young children when they when the genocide happened and ended up in refugee camps, and were were rescued and came over, they may not have known, not have known exactly where they, when they were born. Um, or maybe somebody that was a census uh, taker uh, met somebody at the front door of a house that had a large extended family 
and a bunch of these people were at work and whoever the, the informant was, you know, they asked him, when did, when did each of the people came, come over? What was their age? How many years were they married? Uh, they may not have known a lot of those things, so they just had to kind of guess at a lot of those things. And that's why it's important to look at the 1910, 20, 30, and 40 census and see if there's some kind of agreement between those. Um, whoever's recording the information may not be able to, to uh, converse just to a, due to a language difference. A lot of these people that came over spoke very little English. And a lot of the people who were recording the information, the, the clerks, uh, uh, draft registrars and things like that may not have been able to, probably didn't know how to speak Armenian. So I think a lot of things got lost in translation. Um, you had a census taker going to somebody's house, let's say the middle of January in Detroit, Michigan. Um, they're, they're carrying work documents, notebooks and things like that from door to door gathering information. And then when they get home, then what they did is they transcribed that information into the official document that we see the, the image of when we're looking at a, uh, uh, something online. And sometimes they couldn't read their own handwriting. Uh, so some of those errors occurred there. Um, when somebody says, where, where were you born? They didn't say what village, what village, Kaza, San Jack, Villiet were you born in? They just said, where were you born? And sometimes somebody would say, I was born in Armenia. Um, Armenia as a country didn't exist until 1918. So um, when somebody says, like my grandfather, you know, I knew he was born in Armenia and I knew the name of the village, but I spent years trying to find that village in the Republic of Armenia. And then once I realized that he wasn't born in Armenia, he, was, he wasn't born in Russia, he was born in, in a, a Eastern Turkey. Then, then I was ab actually able to find it on maps for Eastern Turkey. But if I look at his ship manifest, draft registration, census records, uh, marriage records, they all give a different place of birth. And I'll explain why that is. Um, sometimes on uh, things like death records and even marriage records, uh, they said, you know, what, what were the names of the parents? And let's say somebody dies at age 80 and his 60 year old daughter is providing the information and it said, what was his mother's maiden name? She may not have ever met the mother uh, and uh, you know, really just had to guess or they left it blank. And in some cases I've actually seen probably records that have resulted uh, from deliberate falsification. Somebody lied about their name. Uh, they said they were married to somebody on the ship manifest when in actuality, you see them getting married to this person a week later, you know, so, but I think that probably is less, less uh, likely a reason than they just didn't know or the information kind of got lost in translation. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that frustrated me, I said with my own grandfather's information is every record had a different birth date. Uh, I started out with his death record that said he was born April 15th of 1883 and then every other record I found had a different date so you know my hypothesis was these guys really didn't know when they were born and they were just kind of guessing at the date so what I did is I looked in the World War I draft registrations I had about 7,500 entries at the time and I looked at the day of the month they were they said they were born and um, you would expect them to be fairly evenly distributed from one to maybe 29 or 30, um, um, and then a little bit less on 31, since most, most months don't have 31. <clears throat> but out of this sample set of about 7,500 records, here's what I found. So you see all these people being born on the 15th of the month? You know, was that uh, something in the water in Armenia where they, a lot of the women gave birth on the 15th of the month? Or I think somebody said, yeah, I know, knew I was born in sometime in April, so, uh, they just said, well, April 15th. And so that became their favorite official birth date. Uh, but then you look, you look also and you can see, can you see the cursor moving here? Good, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you see also you have spikes at 1, 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. So they, they also seem to favor the uh, days of the month that uh, uh, were even multiples of five. 
So, you know, I look at this here and I said, yeah, they probably, a lot of people were just kind of guessing or approximating what their birth date was. But again, this is just one type of analysis you can do when you have 150,000 records in your database. Okay, so we're going to talk about the nine different types of primary sources very briefly. Uh, I'm going to spend more time talking about the SHIP manifest, <clears throat> and then we'll talk about some of the other ones and why I thought they were important. Uh, started out with ship manifest. What a ship manifest is, or, or let's talk about what, a, what is a primary source. Primary source is some kind of a document, usually an official document created near, near at the time of an event for some government, religious, or commercial purposes. Um, things like, uh, you know, censuses, you know, somebody went door to door and asked information about who was living in that household uh, at the beginning of that month. Uh, military draft registration, uh, World War I, World War II. <clears throat> they had told all the men of fighting age, you have to come in and register for the draft. Not a lot of these people actually served, but you get some great information in those things. So every, every one of these sources, I'm, I'm getting the information from the original images that are, that are online. Probably 95% of what I've got is available on Ancestry.com or FamilySearch.org. Ancestry is a subscription service. Uh, Family Search is for free. Um, there is a lot of overlap between records that are available on both sites, but I use both sites because sometimes the image is a lot sharper on Family Search, but the, the uh, search engine is better on Ancestry. So I may find the record on Ancestry, get kind of a fuzzy image of it, and then find the same record on Family Search and then abstract that. So every single one of these entries in my database have come from me or somebody else looking at the original image of the record. I don't look at other people's indexes. I don't really spend much time looking at what the ancestry.com person or familysearch.com or family search indexer said, because I really don't care what they said. I, if I can look at the original image, I and my uh, volunteers, we can make a better determination since we're much more familiar with the Armenian names. Okay, so uh, let's talk about ship manifest. Everybody who came to America overseas um, uh, should, in in theory, uh, appear on a ship manifest somewhere. Um, Judy's uh, was it your grandfather? Judy is one of the exceptions where uh, he was a, a crew member on a ship and jumped ship. So he didn't appear on a ship manifest, but by and large, most of the people that appear on ship manifests, or most of the people who came into the country appear on a ship manifest. Well, actually, <laughs> he, he did appear on an immigration document. Okay, what kind of document? And, um, and so it, it was, in a sense, a ship manifest. It was through in the immigration um, avenue. Okay, and, okay. Uh, so you're, yeah, so you're I gonna mean, find- it was, it was illegal. Yeah, so most of these people did appear on a ship manifest. Um, starting in about 1923, uh, the United States government enacted some very, very strict immigration restrictions. So a number of these people that wanted to come to America were not able to. So they went to uh, Canada for, for a few years until they could get into America. Uh, other ones uh, might have gone to Cuba or Mexico or even uh, Argentina or Brazil, and then eventually they came into America. Um, some of the ones that came in uh, overland from Canada or Mexico, um, they appear in a border crossing document through a land border crossing. So th those are some of the reasons you won't find them on a ship manifest. And about a year or two ago, I actually started abstracting some of these border crossing documents as well. So a ship manifest is a document, it's designed, let, let's talk about the United States ship manifest because they're a lot more robust than the ones from Canada. Um, the United States government, the immigration service at that time, let's, let's say 1920, um, designed a document and said, everybody that's coming in that's gonna be delivered to a United States port has to be on the ship manifest and has to answer a bunch of different questions, okay? So where was this thing created? It was create. It was designed by the U.S. Immigration Service, but it was uh, filled out by the steamship company. So let's say uh, you know a lot of Armenians came from the French Atlantic ports like La Havre, uh, Boulogne, um, you know some of those, uh, and the steamship companies 
when they sold the tickets for people to come over, they filled out this form using the information that the people provided when they purchased these tickets. So they filled out this form um, and it has a lot of great information in it. it, it you, know, you can see what port they sailed from, uh, the date, uh, where they arrived, the date, uh, where they were born, uh, where, the, where was their last permanent residence, who were they joining, who were they leaving, um, and all this other information. But this information uh, was filled out by the steamship company. Um, so you get, there was this very persistent myth that said, the immigration official at Ellis Island changed my ancestor's name, and that is a myth. Um, the immigration officials didn't even fill out these forms. The forms were filled out by the steamship company uh, based on the uh, purchases of tickets, uh, usually several weeks in advance before they actually sailed. And uh, then when this steamship arrived at the U.S. port, let's say Ellis Island, the uh, uh, immigration off or the commanding officer of the vessel, you know, probably more likely one of his subordinates, would carry this document that lists all the passengers and then present it to the immigration officer. And if you look at the top of the ship manifest, um, <clears throat> you can see exactly what it says. It says all aliens must be fully listed and the commanding officer of each vessel carrying such passengers must, must upon arrival deliver the lists thereof to the immigration officer. So they, these lists were created, any misspellings, any misinformation, uh, was put on there long before they even uh, departed from the uh, the original port. And then what happened is many of these passengers, they purchased uh, a steamship ticket. They, they Their names got put on the steamship and then they never got on board the ship. And so what happened then is you see a big uh, horizontal line through that person's name, uh, both pages. Uh, and sometimes they said not on board or did not board which indicates that they never did board the ship even though they bought a ticket. Um, and in many of those cases, uh, you find another ship sometime from the, usually from the same port, maybe a week or two later or, or a few days earlier where they actually did sail. So um, you may find their name on a, on a ship, on a, on a manifest, and then that person never actually sailed on that ship. So you, you wanna find, look for another ship from, usually from the same port a few days later. <clears throat> Now, when they did arrive, the immigration officers, uh, you know, these people, if you've ever been to Ellis Island, uh, you can see these pictures of these, these uh, passengers in these long lines waiting to, be, waiting to talk to somebody and be inspected. Then when they talked to the officer, usually they had uh, some kind of a, a person there who could act as a translator. And then they asked them some follow on questions. And where I did see the uh, Ellis Island or immigration agent changing names is they would, they would put a more easily recognizable Armenian name in there because the person would say, oh yeah, that's misspelled. My name should be Chorbagian. So then they, they, wrote, they took this Choragian and they changed it to Chorbagian. So by and large, most of the notations on there are really correcting information that was incorrect to something that is more correct. Uh, what you'll often see is is changing the uh, occupation on these forms. You know, somebody will say, it'll say on the form, I'm a farm laborer because they were part of rural part of Turkey. And then uh, when you look at it, it says, no, I'm really a, a blacksmith or I'm really a, a mechanic. And then that'll be, that'll be on there. But uh, just some fantastic information on, on these ship manifests. Um, starting in 1907 is really when they, the, the form took its, uh, took its uh, most uh, robust format. Prior to that, they didn't even ask what the birth date, what birthplace was. They said, what was your last place of permanent residence? But uh, it wasn't until 1907 they really said, where were you born? Actually, late 1906. Um, and then at that same time, they said, who are you leaving in the old country? So if you find your person on a ship manifest in 1895, you may be disappointed because there's not really a lot of good information on there. But once you start getting into the 1906 and later time frame, then that's when you get all this terrific information on the ship manifest. Um, I've had a number of people that still insist, yeah, my name was, my ancestor's name was changed when they came over on the ship manifest. And I said, have you ever seen the ship manifest? And they say, well, no, I haven't been able to find it. 
And every time somebody's told me that, when I find them on a ship manifest, I find the original Armenian name on the ship manifest. And then I, then I find in a census later or something else, I see that name starting to change. And in this case, here was a doctor, uh, Paul uh, Donigian, um, who arrived in, he was one of the first arrivals, 1882, settled in uh, Brookshire, uh, and uh, in a 1900 census of Waller County, Texas, where Brookshire, as you see, now he's starting to use Donegan, okay? And I found um, him on the 1910, this is from a, a screen from my database, I can find him on the 1900, 10, 20, 30 census, and he's using Donegan as the name. He applied for a passport in 1911, using Donegan, and then when he died uh, in 1930, uh, he was using Donegan. But when he came over, he, he was a, uh, when he came over, he was a Donegan. And so if any of you, uh, your family lore says the name was changed to Ellis Island, I really would love to try to find that record and see if uh, we can either prove or disprove that. Okay, and I've written a long article on this uh, topic about the name change. And if uh, you just go to Google and search on Armenian Weekly Arslan, you'll find two articles that I wrote. This is one, and I'll talk about another one later on about the place names. But uh, you know, I encourage you to take a look at this, and it's got some, a lot of good graphics and things like that showing what these documents look like. Okay, now we're going to briefly, let's see, it's not... Okay, so we're going to briefly go through some of the other, uh, the value of some of the other types of records, and then I'll pause again for questions. Okay, censuses, the thing I like about censuses is they show the family groupings. Uh, when these men came over without their wives, uh, mainly for employment before the genocide, they lived, a lot of them lived in boarding houses where they were together with a number of men, usually from the same, a lot of, from the same village, but you did start to see some of the families coming over, the husband, wife, and the children. And in the census, you see the extended families. You'll see the husband, wife, uh, children. You might see the mother-in-law. You might see some uncles and things like that, which could give you some names that you really were not aware of and some information about when that person came over. Um, so that's, that's the great thing about censuses. Okay, military draft registrations, World War I, Draft registrations were 1917, 1918. Canada even had some uh, some registrations that were are useful there, but most of them are from the, United, from the United States. World War II, there were draft registrations starting in 1940 and going all the way through 1945, actually 46. Um, and so in the World War I draft registrations, if you're, and these were men only, uh, if they were born between 1872 and 1900 and they were living in the United States at that time, they should appear on a draft registration card. Um, World War II draft registrations uh, were men of fighting age, which were ones born between 1897 and 1920, 1930, or actually 1928. And then they also had a thing called an old man's draft registration, which were uh, men born between 1877 and 1897. So I would have qualified as an old man uh, from that draft registration, but I would have been required to register as well. The best part about the draft registrations is they <clears throat> show in many cases what village or town they were born in. And so I may have something that just gives the province and or Armenia or Turkey or Russia, but then I find the draft registration, it actually says Sergeville, which I know is just a town of about a thousand people in, in the village of the province of Erzurum. So that's the great thing about the draft registrations is they give the town of the village of birth in a lot of cases. Uh, they'll also say, who is your nearest relative or dependent? And uh, in World War I draft registrations, it may actually be the name of the wife they left in the old country who didn't, su who didn't survive the genocide, but they didn't know where this, where this wife was. So you see the, the, the name of the person, uh, and this might be the only time that, person, that wife's name is ever mentioned. Okay, birth records. <clears throat> These are birth records of children that were born in the United States or Canada. And again, they weren't immigrants, but one of the things about the birth records is many times they mention the mother's maiden name. So this might be the only place you ever see that mother's maiden name is in a birth record from a child who was born in 1923 in Worcester, Mass. Marriage records um, for uh, prior to the genocide, 
you, you know, you had some of these families, particularly in some of the old, older settlements like Worcester, Mass, uh, Brookshire, uh, Texas, Fresno, California, and New York City, obviously, Providence, Rhode Island, where a lot of these families were getting married. And uh, you see the uh, names of the parents of the bride and groom and the, gro and the bride and groom's mother, you'll see her maiden name there. So that's the great thing about the marriage records. And then um, after the war ended, World War I ended, then you start seeing all these refugees coming over starting in about 1920. And you have many of these uh, mail order brides, uh, uh, widows uh, who are coming over and uh, marrying uh, a man who has been in the United States for a while. Maybe he's got his natural, he's been naturalized. And then you see some great information in those marriage records as well, but particularly the names of the parents and the mother and the bride's maiden name and the maiden names of the, of the mother of the, both the bride and groom. Okay, death records um, also list the names of the parents. Uh, it's kind of interesting looking at the cause of death in a lot of communicable diseases, particularly uh, uh, in, those, in the, a lot of the factory towns in Massachusetts, New York City. Um, um, they also list the names of the parents, but again, you got to look at how likely is it that the informant actually knew this information. Um, if, if the person died in the 1950s or 60s, sometimes they may be guessing at the mother's maiden name. Uh, so you have to kind of take some of this information with a grain of salt, just depending on how many years after the event, uh, the information uh, uh, deals with it. Okay, naturalization records, I think are probably the most valuable record I find um, because they ask a whole bunch of great questions about uh, where they were born, how they got here, um, you know, what their occupation is. Um, it, many times it, it says, what, when did you arrive? What port did you leave from? What port did you arrive from? What was the name of the ship? And that usually helps me locate the ship manifest. Now, again, this might be 20, 30 years later, and many times they're guessing at their arrival date and the name of the ship. So, so lots of times, so I find they only get the name of the ship right, maybe, uh, 25 to 50% of the time, they rarely ever get the date exactly right. It's usually they were within a month or two. Usually they get the arrival port right because that's something they probably wouldn't forget. Um, but it really is the best thing for helping me find the ship manifest. Um, the petitions for naturalization uh, starting at about 1930 uh, list names of their children with dates and places of birth. And sometimes these might be children who were lost uh, to the genocide, and this is the only place you'll ever see that name and, and birth date uh, listed. Uh, starting in 1930, they actually had uh, uh, photos on many of the naturalization applications. So sometimes these might be the first record you actually see of what this person looks like. And so what I try to do is to copy that photo and attach it to any record that I find in my database for that individual. And I've got about uh, 2,500 records so far. Okay, passports, very similar to naturalization applications. They ask, um, when did you arrive here? Uh, oftentimes, what ship? So that helps me find the ship manifest. Uh, passports are for US citizens only, so um, they have to have been naturalized before. So usually I'll find a naturalization record, and then I'll start looking for a passport for that person. Passports are online, passport applications are online through 1925. Hopefully the other ones will be released later on, but through 1925, if somebody had a passport, you should be able to find it. And sometimes these passports have some great photos because they started adding photos starting around 1915. So, uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool to be able to find a new photo you've never seen of your family member from 1915, 1920, something like that. So that's, that's the great thing about these passports. Okay, the last thing I added was newspaper ads, which are primarily missing persons ads. And uh, these ads are, were placed in Armenian language newspapers, uh, uh, printed in, in the United States, uh, maybe in Chicago, Boston, Fresno, and they're trying to find family members that are still left in the old country. Um, and some of these might list 10, 15, 20 different family members. It might list my wife, my three children, my mother and father, my uh, father's brother and his children, list them all by names and what village they were in. Um, 
Sometimes this is the only place I ever actually see the name of the village, if it's a small village. And many times I've seen family members mention in here that nobody has ever heard of and you don't find them in any other records. Um, and so what I've done is I've clipped these articles and they actually appear in my abstract. So, and those of you who can read Armenian, um, you know, can see some of the other information that's in there that I haven't abstracted, you know, such as where this person was last known to have been, um, you know, that, or, I, or maybe they mentioned I got a letter from this person in 1917 from uh, uh, Bulgaria or something like that. Uh, but these are, these are some fantastic records and I've uh, just uh, kind of scratched the surface on trying to abstract some of these things. But uh, you know, these I think are some of the most uh, interesting and, and, and heartbreaking, some, some of these ads trying to find family members that uh, they never found again. But some of these family members they actually did find. And uh, when I am able to find one of these family members in other records, I'll link the missing persons ad uh, you know, to those other records, so you can actually see when they did arrive. Okay, so um, there's a lot of great uh, demographic information you can get can get in here by doing data mining from this this information. Uh, when I did a presentation in Fresno, uh, California, which is where my my family, uh, my parents grew up, um, one of the questions I had was. Did they come directly to Fresno County or did they go someplace else first and then move to Fresno County after they've been in the United States for a while? And what I found was um, that, and this was a sample size at the time of about 710 individuals, is about a third of them actually spent a few years in New York State before they came to California. Um, about a third of them were in Massachusetts. And then there was some portion of people you know, that came from some other places, but only about a third of them actually came to California when they first came to, to the United States. And you can see the same kind of patterns, you know, for, for a lot of the other places that aren't on the East Coast. So, you know, basically what I'm doing is I'm, is everything I'm doing is I'm finding original documents. I don't do any, I don't do, don't abstract somebody else's abstract. I don't abstract an index. Every single thing in my database is from an original document where I can actually see the image. And then what I've done for each type of document, like in this case, death records, is I've created a spreadsheet for capturing all this information. And then we take information from, you know, in this record, it was the upper right hand corner, you know, and I put it here, but you know, the record, this was for uh, St. Louis, Missouri, but a record for uh, uh, Bradford, Ontario might have a totally different format, but I still, you know, put it in the same spreadsheet. And then when I have volunteers that say, gee, I would like to, you know, abstract death records for Brantford, Ontario from 1910 through 1930, I send them a spreadsheet and then they just send it back to me, you know, usually a few weeks later. And then I incorporate that into the database. So that's really the process. It's just taking information from the original record, putting it in the spreadsheet, and then providing enough information as a citation or any of you who find a family member in my database can go back and find that original record, usually on ancestry.com or familysearch.org. Okay. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let's stop for some questions here and then I'm gonna go into the database itself, what it looks like, and then we'll do a live demo here. So let's give maybe uh, you know, two or three questions here and then I'll move on. Okay. Uh, actually, Mark, I have a question this yeah. whole week. Yeah. Uh, uh, someone like me who, uh, I was born overseas, Beirut, Lebanon also, mm -hmm. but coming from a very small family, and I myself don't have relatives in this country now. Right. Uh, so how can I benefit from all this? How can I check and see if there's any relatives that can be connected? Yeah, this is not a as much value for those of you who um, were from a different part of the diaspora or, or you know, you came over from the, uh, the country of Armenia in, in the 1980s. But if you know what village in the old country, either either in uh, you know, the Russian empire or the, or the Ottoman empire where your family originated, you can look in this database and I've got a view where you can look at everybody from that village who came to America that's in my database. 
Um, so, so that's one of the things you can look at. The other thing is if you have a, an unusual name and you know what part of the Armenian homeland you came from, you can look at other people from that, that have that same last name that came from that same place like Palu or Beatles or Moosh or uh, Gumri, which was Alexandropol or Kars or one of those places. You can see, you know, a bunch of other people with your same name that came from that same part. So that, that might be of some value. Or if you have some family lore that says, you know, I, my grandfather had a brother that came to Detroit in 1910 and we never heard from him again, but we know what his name is. You can, you might be able to find him and a bunch of information about him in your database. Uh, one other thing is if you've uh, done a, an autosomal DNA test, and have found relatives in America and you wanna find out more about how they got here, uh, who their family members were in the old country, uh, you can use the database to do that as well. So there are some things that might be of value to those of you who are uh, from another part of the diaspora who came to America in the years after 1930. Yeah, uh, That's a great question, yeah. And I wish I, wish I had more stuff on the recent records, but I just, you know, right now I've, I've spent probably, you know, better part of the last 10 years just abstracting this, this set right now. Yeah, thank you for doing it. Yep. Uh, I, I, um, I know that my grandfather is coming from Moosh. I was being right. kind of like seeing mm -hmm. I, my gran grandmother, they were both orphans and mm -hmm. my grandmother was from Van. I definitely, if, if, uh, if the, the database I can access to, I, I will check them. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely take a look at where your family originated, if you know the name of the town. And, you know, many of these places like Moosh, I could probably show you 5,000 people that came from Moosh that are in the database. And maybe some of those are names that are familiar to you. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay, I'm going I'm to move on here right now. So let, let's, let's talk about what, what this thing actually looks like. Okay, there are two pages. There's the home page. And that's the link to the home page. And when you get the PDF file, you should be able to click on this thing and go right to the home page because I've got a hot link there. And this just basically describes the project, talks about all the different sources, uh, kind of gives some historical context. But the meat of it really uh, is in the queries and reports, which is all the data that I've that I've abstracted. So this is where you do all the searches here. And there's two types of searches you can do. One is a query, and the other is a report. And we'll talk about the difference between those two. Um, one of the big struggles here is I can show you any kind of name um, and probably show you 25 different spellings of that name in the American records. You can take a name like Koyumjin, Mugurdichian, and I could probably show you well over 100 spellings of names like that, okay? So just about every record you find, even for the same individual, is gonna have the name spelled differently because spellings were phonetic in those days, okay? And, uh, you, you know, I'm looking at some of the names on the screen here, and I, I would, I bet you a lot of money that every single one of you has your name misspelled every single, or mispronounced, or misspelled every single day. You know, my dad shortened the name to Arslan, and we still get unbelievable, change, or, you know, misspellings of that name, okay? You know, and I'm looking at some of these other names, and I know everybody's got that same experience. <clears throat> so... I've got a way of, of handling that by standardizing the names into a standard spelling. Uh, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit of detail later on, but I'm not saying it's, it's the correct spelling. I'm just saying if I see 120 spellings of Mugurdichian, I'm going to have to pick one spelling to represent all the other spellings. It's just a grouping of all these different names that have similar pronunciations. They might even be different names, okay? But I've grouped them together because I really can't distinguish all the misspellings from each other, and I give that grouping a label. And I call that a standardized last name, okay? And that, but you can also look up the name 125 different ways too, if you want. Okay, the other struggle was place names. Uh, like, like personal names, every place name can be spelled a whole bunch of different ways too, okay? And then the, the darn Turks, they changed the, the names of all these villages in the 20s and 30s. And, you know, so there's a lot of those place names don't exist anymore. Uh, and then when somebody says, where were you born? Were they talking about what country were you born in? What province, which they call a vilayet in the Ottoman Empire? Uh, what county were you born in? That's a kaza. Or what village or town were you born in? And every single record 
the person might give a different answer. And you get very frustrated because you say, didn't this person know where they were born? In actuality, they knew exactly where they were born, but they were answering the question differently using a different uh, you know, location in this hierarchy of names. If somebody says, you know, Mark, where do you live? Uh, if I said Carrie, most of you would have no clue where Carrie is. So if somebody's, so it's based on, the answer I give is based on the context. You know, somebody in Texas says, where do you live? I'll probably say I live in North Carolina. Or if somebody's in, uh, lives in Richmond, Virginia, they say, where do you live? I'll say, well, I live near Raleigh. And then, but if somebody in uh, my Eastern North Carolina says, where do you live? I said, I live in Cary, North Carolina. It's near Raleigh. If somebody in Raleigh says, where do you live? I'll say, I live in Cary. If somebody in Cary says, where do you live? I'll give them the name of the subdivision or maybe even the name of the street. So the same thing happened with all these different records for these individuals. They say, where were you born? And every single answer might be different. And when you understand the hierarchical structure of place names, you realize they, they really were given a consistent answer, but they were just picking a different place in the hierarchy of, of place names. And we'll, we'll talk about that some. And that's another one of these long articles I wrote for Armenian Weekly. Okay, standardized names. Okay, Th this was a name. This was actually the family name of the of, of Tracy uh, who uh, started the Armenian genealogy group on Facebook was Gurjigian. And this is, and I probably found 75 different spellings of this name. And this is just a handful of different spellings. And every single name they're spelled differently. Every single record they're spelled differently. So what I did, uh, and usually, if I, if I was able to find this in a missing person's ad, I would, I would be able to see how this name was actually written in Armenian, which allowed me to transliterate it. And I, was trans, I transliterated most of these names to the Western Armenian transliteration because in the period I'm studying before 1930, about 95% of the Armenian immigrants to Canada and the United States came from uh, the former Ottoman Empire. So I, I just decided I would use the Western transliteration. So. Uh, I took all these different names, grouped them all together, and that's the label I named. So if you want to find somebody, something on a Gurjigian, you can search on any one of these spellings, but you can also search on, the, on this name here and it'll tie them all together. Okay, I'm not saying it's the correct spelling because in my dad's family, you know, they say, what's the correct spelling of your last name? Well, we, we go by four different spellings, so it'll take your pick. But this is just a tool to make it easier to find who you're looking for. Okay. <laughs> Question? Okay, switch. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other thing is place names, just as variable as personal names, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about the Ottoman Empire, uh, but the same thing applies for the Russian Empire, the Persian Empire, and, and other parts of, of the diaspora. In the Ottoman Empire, the, uh, the country of Turkey was subdivided into these u administrative units called vilayets. And a vilayet is like a state or a province, okay? And you can see, you know, there were probably about 20 different ones throughout here. You know, here's, you know, here's Erzurum, uh, Diyarbakir, uh, you know, you can see Mamertal disease, also called Harput, uh, Aleppo, Adana, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, Mush or Beatlis and, you know, uh, Sivas all throughout here. So that was the that was the top of the hierarchy. And then each one each one of these, this is the Vilayet of Erzurum again. This is from a French map from the 1890s. Uh, the Vilayet was set was separated into the next lowest administrative unit which is which is a Sanjak or Sanjak. And it's and usually there's three or four that everyone's broken into. Uh, and uh, you know you see Erzinjan you, know, you can see uh, Bavazi, which very few people came from this one. And then you can see the, uh, the Sanjak of Erzurum, which is also the same name as the Vilayet, okay? And then the little district or county that my grandfather came from was down here. So, so the Sanjaks were broken up into these smaller units called Kazas, K-A-Z-A, okay? So you start out with the Vilayet, which is like a state or province. You have a Sanjak. You have a casa, and then you have this other one that's like a township that we very rarely ever see, and then you have a town or a village. So if you look at Texas, for example, you know you have Texas, you have South Texas, because we really don't have a thing equivalent to a Sanjak, but let's say it's South Texas or the Panhandle or whatever. 
And then you have the causal, which is like a county, like Waller County. And then the county is broken up into, into either townships or uh, uh, justice precincts in Texas, okay? And then within these, then you might have towns or villages, okay, like Brookshire. So this is, this is very similar here, okay? Uh, in Erzurum, this, this was the village my grandfather was born in. This was the name of the Kaza. It was in the Sanjak of Erzurum, which was in the Vilayet of Erzurum, okay? Anybody, <clears throat> anybody here from Tamarza or Everegg? Okay, that was, that was another uh, place. That was, that was the name of the uh, town. It was in the Kaza of Everegg. It was in the Sanjak of Kazeri, and it was in the Vilayet of Ankara, okay? So if I have a person that was born in Tomarza and I find 10 records for that individual of different types, sometimes they, one record, they might say I was born in Tomarza. Another one, they might say I was born in Kazeri. Another one, they might say I was born in Evereg. Another one, Ankara. Another one, Turkey. Another one, Armenia. And you think, did this person not know they where they were born or did they just move around a lot and got confused? But they were really born in Tomarza, but they just gave different answers depending on what the context of the question was or whatever mood they were in at the time. So understanding that Tamarza was within Everek, which was within Kazari, which was in Ankara, which was part of Ottoman Turkey, is very important to help, help you figure out these place names. The biggest challenge you also have is the principal town is often the same name as the Kaza, which is often the same name as a Sanjak, which is often the same name as a Vilayet. So, just about every one of these things, you don't know whether they were born in the in the town or, or small city of Sivas, or the Kaza of Sivas, or the Sanjak of Sivas, or the Vilayet of Sivas. So you might have to find a bunch of different records to see if any of those records actually give another small town within that Vilayet. Same thing with Vaughn, same thing with Erzurum, same thing with Beatles. Uh, same thing with Ankara, same thing with Aleppo, Adana. Every single one of these, you have the same name being used for all of these different entities. And it's not until you can look at 10 different records for that person, can you really reach a conclusion about was they, were they really born in that large city or were they born in a small village on the outskirts? Harpet is, is another great example. There are about 30 or 40 different small villages on the plain of Harpet. And most of the records for that person will say, I was born in Harpet or Mamert Olaziz, which was the Vilayet, when in reality they were born in a little tiny village like Tatum or uh, you know, one of these other little villages on the outskirts of Harpen. Okay, very important concept. So again, this is something that I answered many, many times for people, and I learned a whole bunch of stuff as I was doing the research. So there's another article in the Armenian Weekly called, So Where in Armenia Was Your Family From? So just Google this and you'll find those two articles and you know, just some time when you're inter just have some extra time, you know, you're, you're home in uh, coronavirus uh, quarantine, read that article. You find it, I think you'll find it interesting. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to pause briefly for some questions, maybe two or three questions, and then I want to really get into the meat of this, which is the actually doing a live demonstration from the, from the website. So any questions before I start the live demo? Hi, uh, Mark, this is Margaret from Minnesota, and I'd like to ask you a question. I have a cousin that's up in the New England area, but I can't seem to get an address or a telephone number for her. Any suggestions? This is a person that's living right now, right? Yes. Okay, well... Her parents are dead, her grandparents are dead, but I'm hoping that she might have some information Mm -hmm. that will help me with my list. Well, I try to find missing or, or uh, missing living people quite a bit as well. And lots of those people I'm able to find eventually on the internet. Uh, if you know what town they live in, there's a lot of like white page directories, which will say, here's the person's name, here's the last known three addresses, and here's 10 phone numbers. And that hasn't worked. Okay, well. I mean, that's what I would do. The other thing is sometimes I would find, try to find that person. I'd, I'd Google obituary and then that person's name or some of the names. Maybe I might find that person mentioned in an obituary five years ago along with other family members and okay. try to find those people. But that's, how, that's what I do. Uh, the other thing else I'll do is I'll get into Facebook and I'll just try to find that person's name or 
or a close relative of theirs, let's say I know that person's sister or cousin, then I'll look on their Facebook page and see who their friends are and then see if that person is one of their Facebook friends. Uh, or just contact that person and say, you know, do you know where so-and-so lives? So there's well, a lot of different techniques. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not, but that's usually what I try. I've tried the church priest down in New Jersey where her parents were, mm -hmm. and I haven't gotten any help. I was just wondering if there might be any kind of, any, any suggestion that you might have thought of that I hadn't tried. Are you in the Armenian Genealogy Facebook group? Yes. Have you asked if anybody knows that person? No, that one I haven't done. Yeah, that's what I would do. Is I, I would just say, hey, I'm looking for this you know, person. They're a DNA match to me. They're a cousin. Can anybody uh, put me in touch with this person? Send me a private message. Good. I yeah, will try that. Thank yeah, you. I would, I, would, I would try that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people all over the country and all over the world that are in that thing. And I'm, I'm amazed at how many people know, know different people. Yeah, I'm going to agree on that because I've been a member of that group for a while and it never occurred to me to even ask. Mm -hmm. and, and, and after posting something uh, just about a few minutes ago, immediately I have somebody responding, so, yeah. uh, responding which is amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just, very helpful people in that group. And, yeah. and it's, it's a great group to be in. And yeah, that's what I would suggest, yeah. That's I was just going to ask if you can go three, um, three slides back. I thought I recognized a town. It started with the letter D. Um, yeah, right. Was it there? It was went right after that. No, it was a close-up of the of the names of the, I guess. No, no, it's. I don't know where it went. Mark, I just want to mention okay, thank, that thank this you. is all being recorded, and we'll provide a link for oh. people if they want to go, watch it again, or great, that, thank you. that weren't able to see it, but. Um, in any case, I just want to kind of keep you moving here. Yeah, so. yeah. I think I probably I Thank probably you. need to need to get into the uh, demonstration because I think that's probably the most interesting can part I, here, and I don't want to run out of time before people have got to leave. Okay, so Mark, can I can I add something? Do you mind? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Um, I I uh, wrote you information about finding my my grandfather's immigration, and he was um, he illegally entered the, the country in New Orleans mm -hmm. on a freighter. But the way I found that was, I think it was on Ancestry, was a document called a Declaration of Intention. And mm -hmm. basically what that was, was he was, um, he was saying he was going to become a U.S. citizen and he was, uh, he was not going to be a citizen of his previous country. It wasn't the same as his naturalization certificate, yeah, which the, the, was the, in 1921. Yeah. But that document, which came from immigration, I guess, immigration and naturalization, it's, it was not something that I was looking for, but it gave me the information about the ship that he came on. Mm -hmm. And that's, that allowed me to find him as a, an alien, seamen instead of instead of coming in and at one of the um, legal ports of entry mm -hmm. so declaration of in, of intention is another document that apparently yeah. exists for some people yeah for naturalization records there are two documents that i'm abstracting and uh, i've abstracted about 10,660 naturalization records uh, the two documents are the Declaration of Intention and the Petition for Naturalization. So those are the two yeah. documents that you have to fill out. Uh, usually they're within seven years. And those are that, that's what I'm abstracting is that particular document you're talking about. That was very helpful. Yep, yep, absolutely. Okay, so I am try, I'm trying to share, let's see. So I'm trying to share the, uh, my web, web screen here. Let me see if I can do that. And I can't see how to share that. So I am going to stop sharing my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, you can only share one screen at a time. And yeah, I'm trying to do a stop share of that one there. Okay, you did stop. So I've stopped it and I want to do a share screen. 
And then uh, let's see, so I'm trying to pick. Now, is, am I, what am I, do you see anything that I'm sharing? Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, okay, I, actually, I, I see the problem. Okay, yeah, yeah so you, you are seeing it. Okay, I, was just, I just had it on. A, I've got two screens in front of me. So you see something that says Armenian Immigration Project? Yeah. Okay, this is, this is the, okay, there, there's, there's two screens I talked about. One is the home page, which is this one right here where I talk about it. And I've got some, you know, pictures that talks about the methodology and all that kind of stuff. I encourage you, if you're not familiar with it, read this one first. And then at the top, there is a uh, button that says Project Reports and Queries. And then this will get you to the other screen here, which has got all the good stuff on there. Okay. So on the Project Reports and Queries, um, what I've got here is um, a listing of the different types of records. And you see the headings on the left in yellow, ads, birth records, censuses, death, marriage, military, naturalization, uh, and ship manifest at the bottom. So after that, you can see how many of those different records are in the database that I've abstracted. So I think there's somewhere between 125,000, 150,000 ship manifest during this time period. And right now I've got about 67,000 entries over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, total entries, 151,000 entries in the database. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, you can search um, through each of these individual record types. So the first thing I'm gonna do, oh, oh, and then we've also got a bunch of photos at the top here. I've got about 2,500 photos in the database, but I thought it's kind of interesting to see what these people look like. So. Whenever you bring up this screen, it'll have just five random pictures. And if you, uh, you know, hit the uh, refresh button, then it'll, it'll give you five more pictures. And so if you want to see what this character looks like, you uh, click on that picture there. And it'll, it'll show you uh, a record where I got that picture. So this person's uh, ship manifest entry, it was, it was Maritza Veznayan, who was from, from uh, Harpet. Okay. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting to kind of see what these people look like and maybe, you know, you might find somebody there that's in, that you recognize. But let's start by looking at the ship. Mark, I'm just going to ask you something real quick. So, yep. you know, Project Save has all the, a lot of photographs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they've been digitizing them and making them available, but um, boy, it'd be fantastic to yeah. tie in with Project yeah, you know, Mark Yagjin's on the thread here. Mark Yagjin, can you do you know any of that information? Um, I'm not really up on it. My understanding is that you know, for years, Project Save didn't really have an interest in digitizing photos, but uh, but over the last few years, they've really shifted gears. And they're starting to digitize things and make things widely available. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with Project Save, um, and uh, that was my experience as well. Mark is that uh, uh, when I first started talking to them, they really weren't interested in, the, in digitizing photos. They just wanted to uh, preserve the original photos. But now I think that's starting to change. I, I have three, three sources of, for photos that go into my database. One is passports, one is naturalization records, the declarations of intent. And then the third one is people just sending me rec uh, pictures of their family members that they find in my database. And so with somebody's permission, I will attach that person. And, I, and I'm putting head, these are headshots only of individuals. Um, but those are, the, those are the three sources. And I'm trying to focus on photos from 1950 and earlier so we can see what people look like in the day. Okay, so back to the search screen here, and I need to get through this fairly, fairly quickly so people can uh, move on with their, with their evening. But um, we have two, two types of uh, searches here. One is queries, and the other is a report. Okay, a report is just a statistical summary. Uh, you know, give me all the different places where people came from, give me the top joining addresses, uh, give me, uh, you know, how many people came from each ship, which are kind of interesting. But the, the really good data here is in the queries where you can search and find the original records and, uh, and the linkages of all the records uh, to each other. So, so I'll show you examples of both. So first thing we're going to do is search ship manifests only. We're going to look uh, by destination date. Okay, destination date is the same thing as arrival date. 
So we click on that there, and then it'll bring up a page, okay? And all these pages are similar in that at the top of the page, I've got a description of what that particular search is looking for, a little description of the database. Um, and then we have some search criteria with these different drop-down boxes, okay? So if I'm looking for a destination year, I go to the drop-down bo box and I can pick a bunch of different years here. Uh, I, can pick, I can pick a bunch of different last names. So every different one of these search screens has got different, different last names on it. Okay, di different search criteria. And then we- Mark, I'm not sure we're looking at this page that you're describing. Uh-uh. Yeah, Mark. yeah, what happens is every time you click onto something, that's yeah. a whole new screen to share. Well, no, is it coming up in a new tab or is it? No. no. The share screen only shows the particular screen that you click onto. So if you if you if you just if you move on and bring up another page, we can't see it. Okay, so what do you see at the top of the screen you're looking right. at? The home, the home page to the Armenian Immigration Project. Okay, it says my screen sharing is paused. Why would that be? Murphy's Law. <laughs> um, oh, resume. Sh let's do resume share. Now you see it again. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So I'm not. So you may, and I'm not sure why it was paused unless I I just haven't hit something, but. So anyway, you've got a description for every one of these queries. You've got a description of the query. You've got some search criteria, and then you've got all the hits that correspond to that search criteria. Okay, and this may be several thousand long. And then uh, at the left side of every single one of these records, you've got a link, a little icon, and this is a magnifying glass icon. Do you see that? What I'm pointing to here, on the left hand side of the screen. So if you want to look at the detail for each one of these entries, you click the magnifying glass icon. And uh, if it's green, that means there are links to other records like ship manifest entries in there. So the green ones are the good ones, okay? And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find as many of these people in the ship manifest entries so that uh, I, can, I can fill out a lot of these things in green and then you can go all over the place and search for things. So um, first thing I wanna do here is let's, let's look at a um, ship manifest entry um, from 1920. So, you see 1914 is a destination year. Everybody see that? Yes. Okay, good. So we haven't moved off of that yet. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to search down to 1920. So now I'll go to 1920 and then it'll refresh the screen here. And you can see I have 7,113 entries, ship manifest entries from 1920. These are Ellis Island and Providence, Boston, a whole bunch of other ports. Okay, so uh, these are the 1920 ones. Uh, and let's say I want to look at um, uh, my last name, or, or I want to look at anyone that deal with my family, which is Arslanian, okay? So what I can do is I can narrow down that 7,113 entries to entries involving my last name, which is Arslanian. So you can go down here, you can scroll down through all the different, these are all standardized names, okay? You can scroll down through all these names, and if you're on a phone, that's what you've got to do. My intent was people did this on a computer where you can actually type in the name. So I'm going to just type in ARS and then it'll get me down to that right section there. And then you can, then you can, you can find. Yeah. So I'm going to find Arslanian, which is my last name. Okay. So then uh, I found, so there were 61, 64 entries in 1920 involving Arslanian. Okay. You can see some of these immigrants were named Arslanian or some variation of that. But there were, uh, there's a, you know, Harputlian, there's Oanesian. Uh, why are these here? Because ship manifest entries, especially 1907 and later, have three different roles on, on the ship manifest entry. You've got the passenger, you've got the name of the person they were leaving in the old country, and you've got the name of the person they're joining in US or Canada, okay? So every, every one of these entries has three different roles. So if any one of those roles was our slaney in a 1920, they'll appear on my list here. Okay, so the person I'm interested in here was this Haiganush uh, Tatesian, who appears on this, on this, uh, she came on the steamship Mauritania from Southampton, England to New York, Ellis Island, uh, arrived on the 23rd of October, 1920. And I have a little bit of information on here. She came with two other people 
<clears throat> who were uh, associated with Arslani, and one was Araxi, who who's actually her sister, and then there's a Sahag Arslanian, and they were all going to either Highland Park or Detroit, Michigan, uh, that area. Uh, they were from Erzurum, or they were born in Erzurum. Uh, last uh, permanent resident for the two ladies was Beirut, uh, and he was in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, okay? So let's say I want to find out some more about Haiganoush beyond what's just in here. So I, I see that that's a green icon. Remember, green icon means there's some additional hot links in there that take you to other records, so green icons are good. So let's click on that one for Haiganoush. Okay, and uh, I do happen to have a picture of her. So I put her picture above her name. Uh, she was uh, leaving an aunt in Aleppo and she was joining an HR Slanian uh, in, uh, who was in Detroit, okay? Uh, Harabed was his name actually. So, uh, so we wanna find out a little bit more about her. So we go down here and first question is, have I found out any more records for the same lady, okay? So I found her in the 1930 census. I found her in the 1940 census. And no, now she's a Maradian, a Moradian, okay? Uh, Americans pronounce these names differently than Armenians would pronounce them, which is kind of interesting. Um, okay, we, fi we find she's mentioned in two military draft registrations. Uh, she's listed in Harabed's World War I draft, World War II draft registration as his nearest relative. And she's also listed in her husband's uh, World War II draft registration as his nearest relative. And now you see she's going by Helen. So she was going by, you know, Haiganush, and then she changed her name to Helen, okay? Uh, we can see her in two naturalization records. She's a spouse on her husband's naturalization record. Uh, and, there, and remember that Judy was talking about uh, declaration of intention and, and petition for naturalization. These are the two different types of records. So we find her mentioned as a spouse in both of these records. We find her 1920 marriage. So she arrived in, look like 23rd of October, 1920. And she's married uh, to uh, uh, Sam Demergian, Sam Maradian Demergian in Detroit about two months later, okay? And then we have her death. Uh, she's mentioned as a mother in a death record uh, for, a, uh, for a daughter who died, died as an infant after a uh, operation for an intestinal obstruction. So we have her, her ship manifest plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other records involving her. Some of these people, we have 10, 15 other records. And you can, and by looking at all these different records, looking at the detail, you can find a lot more information about, about this person. Okay. Mark, I think one thing that would be really helpful, first of all, this is phenomenal. And, uh, and, and I, I think I can speak for everyone here. You can, you can keep going through this all night long and if people want to drop out, you know, they can drop out. But do you have a favorite way that you like to suggest people start? Yeah, what, what I would recommend is, um, you know, look for people that where, where you know where, where they came from, you know, you know where they lived and then it'll probably be easier for you to find the person there. And then, uh, and then the people that you are missing, then, you know, then search for them later on. But um, I just want to go through a few more of these screens. And then I'm going to show you uh, a, a consolidated query where you can search for them across all the different databases. Well, hold on. This data can't be correct. There's no Armenian woman that's five feet, 10 inches tall. <laughs> That's one of the things is the heights on these, especially on the ship manifest, I think are many times I find that they're incorrect. Uh, lots of times I use ditto marks and they say everybody on that sheet was five foot five inches tall. Uh, uh, so that's why it's important to look at other records. There aren't very many records that list the women's height except naturalization records and passports may. Uh, that World War I, World War II graph registrations, I have much more confidence in the heights for the men in those, okay? But yeah, you're right. But again, this is one of those things that's, that's a little bit funky. So um, let, me, let me just uh, just move on here, and then I want to get back to the original search screen, and then we'll, we'll pause for some questions. So uh, let's say I want to find out a little bit more about Harabed Arslanian, this guy she was joining. 
uh, and he was my dad's first cousin, by the way, or second cousin, by the way. Um, I can see two different links under his name, and these are ship manifest entries. So he arrived twice, 30th of January, 1901, he, on, the, on the Amsterdam. He arrived also uh, 4th of May, 1909, on the La Gascon. So I could look at either one of these ship manifest entries to find out some more about them. So let's pick the one from 1909. So now what I'm doing is I'm going to look at his ship manifest entry, okay? And I can see he was joining uh, a brother, and I got, I've got his picture there, and he actually came three different times. I can see all these different people that listed Harabet as their sponsor, okay? So some of these were relatives, some of these were friends, and I can find him on the 1910, 20, 30, 40 census. If I go to the 1940 census or any, any one of these census records, it, I show you the whole household, everybody else who was listed in that same census, okay? So by going through all of these different records, you can find all kinds of great information about their, their you know, the other people that they were connected to, okay? So this return to query button at the bottom that I just hit, that takes you back to the original query, okay? So, so right now, it'll take you back to the 1920 census. I could change that or, or census destination date. I can change the name, I can change the date, whatever. Let's say I wanna go back to that original search screen. What you can do is you can just click on this little ship here and then that takes you back to that original search screen there. Okay, five pictures, all these different things here. I wanna show you a couple more things on a ship manifest and then we'll, we'll go to the, the combined one, okay? So we, we can search on the date they arrived. We can search on a joining address, which says, uh, let's say I want to look at all the people who, who went to, uh, let's say, who said they were joining somebody in Texas. Okay, so I change that. So I, I go from the top to bottom. And let's say I want to go to, you know, people that said they were going to Brookshire. Okay, so now I found 41 people who on their ship manifest, they said I was going to Brookshire, Texas. Okay, so here are all the different people and you can find out, you know, some more information about them and you can see every one of these things, you know, I've got more information on and everyone, many of these screens, you can search on them by name, by the passenger name, the joining name, street address, birthplace, uh, and then the date that, that they arrived. So all kinds of different search criteria and it's different from screen to screen. So that's, that's another way you can look at ship manifest entries. Um, and let's, I just want to show you this. So there's a lot of, you can look at origin port, destination port. Uh, you can look at, let's say a last name. Let's say somebody, somebody give me a last name. Let's do, let's, Why don't you try Hovig? Because he said he doesn't have any uh, family. Um, okay. okay, so so let's, let's look at Ohanesian. Okay, and so I'm going to do O-H-A-N. And so we get Ohanian, okay. And again, this is spelled a little bit different than he spells it because the, the, the French like to put, like to take this sound and make two S's out of it. Okay, if you look at it in Armenian, it's just one S. And, and in the United States, it's usually, it could be anything, but anyway, that's how you fit. So I have 1,240 ship manifest entries for somebody, some variation of Ohanesian, okay. And if you look at that thing, you'll probably see a hundred different spellings of that name, right? Okay, and this, and this is listed in alphabetical order by first name. But uh, again, you'll see all these different spellings of that, okay? So that's another way you can, you can look at it, okay? Uh, one other thing on uh, ship manifest is I wanna show you what a report looks like. So let's say I wanna look at uh, where, where were the, uh, where are these people coming from? So summary by origin port. You know, so this is a list of all the different ports that these people sailed from on these ships. And so that, so I have uh, 67,000 entries and these are all the different ports that people sailed from, okay? A whole bunch of different places, some of which you probably have heard of, some of which you may not have heard of, okay? So that's where they sailed from. Let's look at all the, I see a lot of people fixating on Ellis Island probably for good reason, because a lot of people came through Ellis Island. But let's say I want to say, I want to look at, uh, uh, you know, where they actually arrived at, okay? 
So, you know, Ellis Island, New York was uh, quite a lot, but you had Providence, Philadelphia, Halifax. So, so all of these different places are either border crossings or ports where people arrived at that came to America. Okay, so, and, and Ellis Island might be a little overrepresented there because I started researching Ellis Island and it wasn't until later that I started looking at places like Providence, Philly, Boston, and some of those, okay. So anyway, these are queries as opposed to, or these are reports as opposed to queries. So, so back to Miron's question about where do I spend, where do I recommend they start with? Okay, you could look at different, rec different record types. I could, I could search specifically for passports. I could search for Ohanesi in, in passports, or you know, I could do that in military records and so on. Um, where I spend most of my time is going to this combined section where it actually looks across all of these different source types and, uh, and looks for everybody of a particular name, regardless of where they appeared, okay? So uh, let me, let me before I get that, let me just go to missing persons ads because I think those are interesting because they have an image and then, then we'll go on to some other things. So missing persons ads, let's say, um, somebody give me, a, give me a place name in Turkey. Karen, why don't you give him one? Somebody give me a tip. How about Sisyon from Beirut? Where was somebody's family from in Turkey? Malatya. Um, Malatya, okay. So, so, Malat, so, so you have to have some understanding of what Ville at a province is just to drill down. Uh, so Malatya is in a, is, is in a uh, Ville at called Mamert Aziz which sometimes was referred to as Harpet because that was the biggest city there. And so these are all the different towns and villages within uh, Mamert Aziz where I found people. So you see Sharse, Shemish Kazak, Harpet, and then Malatya is right there. Okay, so, so these, are, these are people that either placed an ad or they were mentioned in an ad and, the, and they add reference Malatya. So there's 131 different people that were mentioned as coming from Malatya uh, in, in the missing persons ads that I looked at, okay? So let me just, let me just take, pick one of them. Let's get this H. Parsigian. So let's see if that's a good one. Actually, that's not a good one because they only mentioned one person. Let's try this one here. Okay, so we've got this one here. He placed a missing persons ad uh, in the Hyrenique newspaper out of Boston. Here was his address. And he was looking for people in Malatya. And here he was looking for uh, Hagop Markarian and his brother Kavork Markarian. And then you see, here's the, the full missing persons ad here. And you can, those of you who can read Armenian, you know, it, it'll have some additional information about that. But what I'm picking out is I'm picking out place names, uh, address, and personal names, okay, of everybody that's mentioned or placed the ad. So I think missing persons ads are a pretty cool thing to look at. So, you know, you can look at them you know, by, where, by the, where they came from. You can look at them, you know, by name, or you can put, look at them by publication and date, if you know that, okay? So now, I'm not gonna go through each of the rest of these, but you can explore each one of these things by searching them by, by place name, personal name, uh, and, so, and location, and so on. Um, but the combined section is, I think, is pretty interesting. Uh, photo gallery. So the photo gallery just says I've got 2,500 pictures there and here's just all the different nice faces of people and the records they appeared on. So I think it's kind of interesting if you just want to see what Armenians look like back in that day. And what I found is a lot, there's people that look all kinds of different ways. A lot of people I'd never would have pictured as Armenians, but anyway. Uh, so you can look across all of these different record types by name, by where they came from, or by where they live in, in the U.S. or Canada, or even Mexico. I've got a few Mexico ones in here as well uh, for some Mexican marriages. But if you want to search by name, so I just def I default to a name, and I'm going to pick my own name, of course. Uh, so I have 1,868 records across all these databases that mention somebody that's that's an Arslanian. Okay, so somebody give me a name. Kazanjian. Kazanjian, okay. So Kazanjian. Okay. So I type in K-A-Z and I try to see if I can see a name that looks like Kazanjian. Okay. okay. And this might not be the way you spell it, but that's the standardized name I think was that one there. So I click yeah, on that's it. it. 
Okay, okay. That that was actually one that's that's fairly doesn't have as many variations. But so I have 1,231 Kazangians that I found. Uh, and if you look at look here, it tells what database it came from. So the ship manifest, a death record, census 1920 census of Fresno, marriage records, military draft registration, missing persons ads, and so on. And I've got it listed in uh, uh, alphabetical order by first name. Okay, and these the first names and the last names here are exactly the way they appeared on the record. And so I, I want to preserve misspellings because I think that's really important because if I see a name that's that's kind of funky, I, I don't want to make an assumption that I know it's really, you know, Eric L. You know, it might be something else. Some of these you can figure out, some you can't. But these are exactly how they appeared in the original record, misspelled or not. And here's where the, what type of record it is. If you find somebody you're interested in, then you just click on that uh, that link there. See, this was a census, okay, for AVK Kazanjian, okay, and I happen to have that uh, guy's came in on in 1902, so I can go to a ship manifest entry, and I can find out all the places I found that person. So that's that's a good thing to do. Is is and if, and if you want to go back to the original uh, query, you just go back there, and then it'll take you back to this thing, and you, you can look at another name. Now, there are going to be many names where uh, you've got it spelled differently than the standard standardized name that I picked, okay? And uh, I'm trying to look at some of these names here. Uh, let's say Harikian, Bar Barajan Harikian. So I don't, if you look in here, I don't think I've got a name that's spelled exactly like Harikian. So I took all the different variations of that name and I gave a standardized name as a label to that grouping of names but let's but if you you guys don't know what my standardized names are and if you can't find your name in here that you're looking for you click on this little button here this is find a standard name okay so what it's going to do is it's going to look through all these record types 150,000 records and it's going to give me a list of every single spelling of every single name that i've ever run across and then you you're going to pick that name and it'll tell you what the standard name is that it was mapped to Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna look for Harikians, see if I found any Harikians. So this is gonna take about seven to ten seconds for it to refresh the thing. So you click on that, and it'll start to paint the screen. And you need to give it about seven or ten seconds to refresh the screen. Okay, so it so it picks, so it pulls up a dialog box here. Okay, so we're gonna go to this dialog box here, where the default is Arslanian, and we're gonna look for H A R I K I A N. So we type in H A R I. All uh, right, so we, so we see all, so you see every single spelling of every single name that I found and, and oops, so, let, so we, let's get back to this one here. Give it about another seven to 10 seconds because I hit enter. Okay, so we see there is a, so I did find Harikian on some record I ran across. Okay, so you click on, click on that and then you click this little thing that says to display the standard name and then you give it about seven to 10 seconds to refresh. And then it'll show you I, that I mapped it to a name, uh, the spelling Harigian, okay? And then what you can do is you can click on this, this little button here, the, the little check mark, and then it'll, it'll take you to back to the search where it plugged in Harigian. And you can see there were 134, 143 entries that I found across all these different databases. And you can see all the different ways that it was spelled. You know, there's a few Harigians in there. There's a uh, Horigian, or, and, you know, some of these are actually the same last name as Varjan, some of them are not, but anyway, that, I group, grouped all of these together, okay? So that's, that's how you search by name, okay? So now let's, let's go back to the original search screen here by clicking the boat or the ship. So now let's say I want to search by place, okay? So it'll bring up all the places that were mentioned in any of these records were, that, that are outside the US or Canada, okay? A lot of different countries represented here, okay? And those of you who, instead of coming from the Ottoman Empire, let's say you came from the Russian Empire, you click on Russia and it'll show all the different places that I found in the Russian Empire, which, which is now where the current country of Armenia resides. And you'll see, all, you'll see a lot of different funny spellings here, but you'll see some that you recognize. Anybody here from Gumri? Okay, that's 
back in the day, that was called Alexandra Pole. Okay, that, that was changed a number of times, so now it's called Gumri. And these are all the different, these are all the different little towns and villages within Gumri. Okay. Uh, Cars is another place where there with where um, a lot, which was in the Russian Empire prior to the genocide. I think from the 1870s until the genocide it was in Russia, then Turkey took it back after World War I ended. Uh, but there's a bunch of different villages and cars. Um, and then you know, so so what I want to do, let, let's say I want to take uh, I want to look for the a town in Turkey. So now, now I go back here. I changed the country to Turkey, which was the Ottoman Empire. And then when I when I go to Turkey, then I it, it presents all the different vilayets that were in Turkey. Remember that big map I had that all the, had all those those colored colored regions within within the Ottoman Empire. Those are the vilayets or provinces. Okay, and. Uh, I don't know anybody here from uh, from Aleppo. Give me give me give me a place you're from. How about Agen? Okay, Agen. Okay, Agen. If you look on the maps, it's spelled E G I N, and it's in Mamre and Al Aziz. Okay, um, the Armenians spell it Agen like A G N. Okay, but if you search on Mamre and Al Aziz. You can actually go to Origin Town and it'll have them all listed there as well. But if I want to limit it to Mamert all Aziz, then I click that up there. If you do all Turkey, it'll show them all down here. But so if I want to look at Augen, uh, you're not going to find it under AGN. You're going to find it. The Armenians had a lot of different names for these places than you find on a map. So the Armenians call it one thing, the Turks call it another thing, the, the English called it another thing, the French called it another thing. So a lot of these place names had a lot of different spellings, okay? Augen, what Armenians called Augen, you'll find on maps in that time frame as E-G-I-N. So, so if I want to, if somebody said they were born in Augen or they were lived in Augen or they left a brother in Augen, you'll find them under here. But if you can also drill down to villages that were within the, the Kaza of Augen. So let's just click here to Augen. Egan, that's what they called it here, okay? And let's see how many people we have that said they were, so we have 751 entries of people that said they were either from Augen or they were looking for somebody in Augen or they had family that, that were in Augen. You know, my, my mother's birthplace was in Augen, for example, from a death record. So these are all the different people from that different town. So this is probably one of the first things back to, to Miron's question about where would I recommend they go first? I would recommend what you do is you look for all these different, you look for, you look for your place of origin, the village or town your family is from, and then you just look down here and you say, oh, I have 751 entries. And these entries, I can sort them by name or by the date the record was. And then I, and then just see if you find any of your family members in there. Okay. So that's, that's, so we looked at by name, we looked at by place. So now I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the original page here, click on the ship. And, uh, or you can look on where they came to in America or Canada. So let's say I know my family, uh, I don't imagine a lot of your family came directly to Texas here, right? Unless you have people here from Brookshire. I, I doubt it. Uh, people, people whose family uh, came here before 1930, give me a, give me a place they, they first came to. Worcester. Okay, Worcester's a good one. Too. Okay, um, so let's. So we're gonna. So Worcester's in Mass. So we change it to Mass, and what it'll do is it'll refresh this page, and the choices that it will give are all the different places in Massachusetts that that I found Armenians in. Okay, and what I did was in Boston, for example. Boston's got a bunch of different neighborhoods. Okay, and sometimes they said I was going to Boston, but sometimes they said I, they actually named the neighborhood they were in. Okay, so what I do is I have the name of the town or the city, and if there's different neighborhoods in there, uh, then I'll just put the neighborhood under that town, but just in parentheses. So, uh, you know, so that's Boston, but you want to look at Worcester. Okay, so we're going to find Worcester down here at the bottom. So there's Worcester. Okay, so this will show you every single record that I found in my database that mentions Worcester. Okay, so I have 11,000 records mentioning Worcester. That's a lot of records, right? Um, and I can search 
I can search for records by person's name, by street address, or by the date of the records. The default is street address. So let's say I want to look at somebody from 52 Southbridge Street, which is a lot of Armenians went to 52, 52 Southbridge. So you scroll Sorry. down here. Okay, so. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you can see you can see all these Armenians that went to 52 Southbridge. Okay, well, probably well over 100 of them went to 52 Southbridge. Uh, actually, the guy, the, the my dad's first cousin who got me started on this thing, he came to 52 Southbridge in 1912, and so I thought that was kind of cool to find him on there. Uh, Kilor, Arslanian. Okay, so that's one one thing. Or you can just hit home, go back to the top. And let's say, I don't know what, what street address it was. The reason street address is good is, is lots of times, if you look at the same street address that your family member lived at, you might find some of their extended family in there, okay? Or I can look by name. So let's look by name. So now it'll, it'll, it'll do it by all the different names that I run across, okay? And now you can see there's 13,000 entries. That's because I, sometimes I had more than one person living at that, at that, at that street address. So there's a little bit more. So uh, what, what was the family name that you were at, you had that was in Worcester? Frankian. Frankian, okay. Orchard and Frankian hap happens to be the standardized name I used, okay. Street. Let's look in, let's look for Frankians. Okay, so, okay. So the standardized spelling that I used for Frankian was just Frank with an I N at the end of it because that was one of the more common ones. So what was what was the name? Giragos. Giragos. Okay. So Giragos uh, could be spelled a lot of different ways. Okay. So here's one Giragos. Here's another Giragos. Here's a Giragos marriage record. Did he did he marry Mary Malumazian? Um, Is that the right Giragos? Well. That might have been her fir her yeah. first marriage. Actually, I, I look, okay, yeah, so, so I think this is, so, so you have a lot of different records for Giragos that are spelled a lot of different ways. Giragos, Giragos, so you see about 10 different spellings of Giragos, okay? Uh, if you, let's, let's just pick any one of these. I'm interested in this marriage record. Anyone on 59 Orchard Street, I see. 50, oh, okay, so they were at 59 or Orchard Street. Okay, let, so let's let's look at Giragos. It was on 59 Orchard Street. There, the, okay, so here's a Giragos. This is a 1940 census record in Worcester, uh, living at 59 Orchard Street. So that's our guy, right? I imagine. That's... Okay, so that's probably him. But let let's check it out. Let's look at. So so you notice that this icon that the magnifying glass is green. That means I have. Uh, I found his ship manifest entry, and I have all the re I have all of his records tied together. So let's see if this is the same one you're looking for. Okay, so we're gonna. So in the 1940 census, he was 47 years old, head of household. Okay, he was a cleaner at the American Steel and Wire Company, uh, and here's the household. So here it goes, Mary, and then uh, looks like five, six, five kids, a daughter and four sons. That's correct. Is that the right family? Uh, my father is George. Your yep. father's George. Okay. And yep. since George was not an immigrant, I don't, I don't have an, I don't have a ship manifest entry for him. Right. But what we can do is we, if we want to find every single record I found for Giragos, which might include others, he came over in 1913. So I might have him in the 1920, 30 and 30 censuses as well. So let's see what we have for Giragos. We can also see what name he had on the ship manifest. So we click on that. And you can see that's how it was spelled on the ship manifest. So that's why you got to be very open-minded about looking for the spellings of these names. Whenever I'm searching for a spelling of a name in Ancestry or Family Search or any place else, I try to use wildcard characters. So I don't, I never search for Giragos like I think it should be spelled. I usually do G, if the wildcard character is an asterisk, I do G star R star S, G star S star. I just, I, I take all of the internal vowels for first name or last name, and I just put wildcard characters because we have no idea what they're going to do with these vowels. You know, the French, since this was a French ship manifest from Le Havre, the steamship Chicago, uh, the people who were preparing these ship manifests from the ticket purchases were spelling them the way the French would spell it. So the G 
would would be G U, you know. So that that's the way they would spell it. Uh, the the sound, the soft S would be two S's. Okay, so just be be aware that these names are going to be spelled every which way. Okay, so this guy he was leaving a, a Museg Frankian from Harpet. He was joining his uncle Bedros Makarian, uh, 71 Summer Street. This was in 1913. Okay. So what other records have I been able to link to Giragos? Okay, so I found uh, three other people who were joining him in 1920 and 21. Uh, Mariam Hosefian joined, she said he was his uncle. There was uh, uh, Rosanna, uh, I guess that was a mother. And uh, Igaya was, was joining him, that was his brother. I found Giragos on the 1920, 1930, 1940 censuses. And you could see these are the different places he was living at those times. Uh, you know, you can see that the ages aren't exactly 10 years apart, but that's pretty typical. You can see he was actually listed as George on the 1930 census. We can see uh, a World War I draft registration, 1917 for, for Gurgis, Giragos, okay? You know, if we want to see what that looks like, you know, we can see that uh, he, his dependents were a wife and child. Uh, he was working as a laborer for some manufacturing company. And he gives a birth date there. You know, is that the same birth date he gave in other records? Uh, don't, don't know. Um, let's see. Birthday. Missing per Oh, he did you know he placed a missing persons ad looking for some family members? Well, I think we've gone over the, this with you before. And uh, my dad, uh, yeah, my that really shocked my dad. Yeah, so, so there was a missing persons ad that he placed. He's here. Uh, and, okay. So, so here are all the people he was looking for. This was, this was 22nd of July, 1919. So he placed a missing person ad looking for his wife and one, two, three, four, five, six child and, and a nephew, brother's son. Okay. And, and it gives the name of the village they were from, which is one of these little villages outside, outside of the city of Harpeth. Yeah. Okay? I and then you can, you know, you can go through here and, you know, you can, you can, you can check, check my transliteration and, you know, you can see some of the names in there, you know, Hatun and uh, Agaya, Hagop, and so on. Okay, and then we, we hit the backspace key to go back to there, and then we can see, here's a here's his marriage. Okay, so. so oh, so he, my father says that those were his brothers. Brothers, okay. Simon, they're all his brothers. Mm -hmm. They're they, not his family. They're not his children. They're not okay. His. okay, but if you look in the missing persons ad, this says it's his wife, and this this is the name for children. So this, so, so this this says, and this and, and this says my so this definitely says my children in here. True, which is my my children. Yeah, this is my children. I mean, so so he may it, there may have been a mistake in the missing persons ad, but that that's what he says, uh, and then he says, uh, let's see. And he says, and my and my my brother's uh, my brother's son. So that's so so this uh, Minas, the last one was his brother's son. So you know you do have the relationship term here that does say it's his children. So and I and again every one of these records you're going to find things that are surprises. Sometimes the record itself might be incorrect. Sometimes your understanding of it might be incorrect, and you have to find multiple records to see you know if if it if it tilts it one way or another. But yeah, that's the interesting thing about these is you're going to find surprises in here and you know, you're not going to be able to answer all of them. Uh, but uh, anyway, Thank you. yeah. So, so anyway, he was looking for his family, July 22nd of 1919, the war had, had ended, uh, you know, a little less than a year before that they're trying to find people in refugee camps, you know, the treat, the treaty of Versailles being negotiated. So these people really don't start coming over until 1920. You see some of the service members coming back in 1919, but most of the people don't start arriving until 1920 and 21. So you see uh, November or 7th of July, 19 or 7th of November, 1920, you see him getting married to this other lady here. So let's, let's just take a look. And this is in Worcester. Let's just take a look at that marriage record. Okay, so he's married. So he's, he's a widow. Okay. So we assume that he didn't never found that that his first wife. Okay, so he married. So he married uh, uh, Mary Malia and that was her 
second marriage as well. So she was a widow that came over. When did she come over? She came over the 12th of August, 1920. They got married, uh, yeah, looks like about three months later. And her last name, her maiden name was Markarian. And we can actually see, it looks like she came over. No, that's her, that's his mother. I'm sorry, that, that's his mother. She her, was D Danielian. Danielian, yeah. Danielian, and her mother's name was Chillingarian, was I think her <laughs> maiden name. But anyway, yeah, she, and, and okay. so Giragos's mother, I, we found that she, can't, she actually came over as well. So she came over in 1920. So if we, if we want to see, find out more about her, okay, so that's. And I have a picture I could probably. Yeah, so, so if you send me that picture, I'll just attach it to this record and it'll, and it'll show up here and it'll show up in this other record as well. So she was coming to join her son. Now, if I want to see who else was on that same ship in 1920, we click this little ship thing and then you wait a few seconds for it to refresh here. And so this is the ship that she came in on and she is, where was she? Right there, okay. So she came in on that ship and she was headed to 37 Laurel Street. It looks like she may have been traveling by herself because if she's traveling with a group of people all going to the same place, usually they're, they're listed together. But you can see, you know, there were probably, I don't know, maybe 30, 35 Armenians on that particular ship. Um, her last uh, place was, so she was born in Harpet but her last residence was Aleppo. So that's where she was in a you know, refugee camp or somewhere in Aleppo before she came here. Okay, so that, so we looked, so let me just go back to, hit home to get back to the top. Mark, is there an export function here that lets you sort of export some of these things that you found? Um, I don't have an export function. That's probably would be a good thing to add. Um, if you, if you want to get in here and do some really in-depth stuff with any one of these things here, maybe using your own software, you can go back to the home page. You can scroll down to where I have a description of, let's say, military draft registrations, for example. Okay. And you can you can do an export. So every one of these tables, you can do an export of CSV file of the entire database. Uh, and, you know, you, you know, like for, for, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can download the entire database table in a CSV format for, for any one of these things, you know, uh, 67,000 ship manifest entries, and then you can do all kinds of, <laughs> of your own stuff with that. Okay. And, and I keep, and I keep those things up to date. Okay. Uh, let's see. Have we covered everything that I wanted to cover? Okay. I, I don't know, but I feel like I've been drinking through a fire hose here. <laughs> yeah, but just, but I recommend, you know, maybe start here, just look for some names or places or things like that. And then if you want to get in and then I would say, just follow the links and kind of go around and see if you can kind of explore and find some new things. Um, you know, you're going to find some things that don't look right and you know, they may be right. They may be wrong, but you really don't know until you find, look at a bunch of different records. I think everybody will find something different than they expected to find. You know, I, I have a lot of people that said, you know, my, uh, you know, grandmother told about the, you know, the genocide and being sent on the death march or whatever. We find out her grandmother came over in 1912. You know, so, you know, just some funny things like that that you, I don't think it's not really funny, but just things like that that you really can't explain but are different than what you expected to find. You know, lots of times they say, yeah, you know, they all came over on the same ship and then you found out, you know, they really came on three different ships within a year. Uh, you know, so there's gonna be some surprises in here, but uh, I would say if you can't find a ship manifest for somebody you know that came to America, send me some information about that person, you know, their full name, you know, about when they arrived, where they lived afterwards, and I'd be happy to find a ship manifest for you because that's really what drives me is trying to find things for people that they're missing so I can help them start to pull together information about their family. Okay. Mark, go, go back to the main homepage for a second. I'm going to do a little plug for you and then we'll see if people have some, you know, questions that, that you can address. Um, okay. So one thing I just want to mention just uh, briefly to everyone that's been participating is that it, it obviously costs Mark money to, you know, maintain this and keep it up and 
Uh, can you go to your little donation? Uh... Yeah, so at the, at the top of my screen here, I've got a little thing that says want to contribute. So there's two ways people can contribute. One is they can volunteer to abstract data from a particular type of record. So those of you who are really uh, firm attention to detail, have a little bit of time on your hand and have an interest and are good with spreadsheets, send me an email. And, and the, my email address is, let's see, let me get to the... Yeah, anyway, it's on, it's on the home page. Uh, bottom of the home page is my email address. Um, I also have a little want to contribute thing here. And this says, if you want to send a little bit of money to help me pay for, you know, I, I, I spend, you know, probably a couple thousand dollars a year on subscriptions to do various things. I do a lot of traveling around. So, you know, if you want to send a little bit of money, you found it to be useful, you can do it this way and it just routes you to PayPal and you can contribute a little bit. Miran, is there anything else you wanted to say? No, but I, I mean, let's see if, if you still have some energy, Mark, if, if people have some questions, let's. Uh... Yep. Okay, so anyway, back to the home screen. And if anybody wants me to look up something or if they have any questions, then I'd be happy to stay here as long as, as long as you want me to. Well, my dad was really curious about his mother who was that Mas uh, mighty on Masmanian. Mm -hmm. um, she had, apparently she had a daughter who died under the Masmanian last name. Mm -hmm. And uh, in um, Family Tree DNA, he actually met um, a Masmanian in Worcester uh, mm -hmm. who he matched up with. And she ended up living in the apartment right above my dad, which is, like ultimately ironic. He he didn't know yeah. her before. Really. Um, and um, and she swears that because you know family tree DNA linked them that they're somehow blood related. But my grandmother only had and like you say maybe there are surprises. But um, from what we know, she had a child who died over there, and and her husband died. Um, and then she reverted back to her Denalian name and never really wanted to talk about the Masmanian experience, mm. then got married as this Frankian. And, and so there's this gap, obviously, in mm -hmm. Agen or Yereki. Um, somewhere between Agen and Yereki, there's quite, quite a uh, mystery. And is there, and does this lady have any, is she still alive or not? No, she died in 1983. Did she leave any descendants? Right she any, did she leave, leave descendants in the United States? What do you mean? This is her son. Did, did, did she have children or grandchildren? This is her son. I'm her granddaughter. No, I, I'm sorry, the lady that lived upstairs that your father didn't oh, know. She, uh, she never got married. Wasn't she an okay. only child? Okay. Um, Margo Masmanian. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say if 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 her, she got her, her she, family yeah. and, and mother's family were both from Agen. That's why we think there's a tie there. That she. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first thing I would suggest is that you see if you're D, if you have any DNA matches. Well, we do on uh, family tree DNA. I mean, with this lady, with this lady's family, or with her, with her. With her, okay. Well, um, there, me and my dad are fourth yeah, cousins. Yeah, okay. So there is some connection back there. So, in terms in terms of my database, you know what, and I'm sure you've probably done this already, is is I would look, you know, go here, and I would search for Masmanian, or I would go here, uh, and you know, and I would ser search for people that are f from that particular village. And maybe see if there's anybody else that mentions any of those people. And I'm sure you probably have done that already. But you know that that's 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 what I would suggest there. You know you, you know you could search there and you could look at all the different people that were from that village. And maybe you might find somebody there that's interesting. The other thing uh, would be to search here under street address and see who else lived at that particular street address where she was upstairs and he didn't know it. You know, and you might find some other extended family members there that, that you know, might lead you down the right path or, or, some, or at least give you some more information you didn't have before. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to explore your, yeah. your site. Right, and, and, and remember, this is just, I'm, I'm just skimming the surface here right now. 
uh, you know, th there are millions and millions of different records and all, and in the last 10 years, I've come up with 151,000 records. So, you know, let's say in the next 10 years, or I still live, uh, you know, and, and can do this, maybe we might be 300,000 records by that point. This is with people helping me too. So uh, if you don't find something in here, uh, and it's a record in the United States, a census record you're looking for, a naturalization record, whatever, send me an email uh, and, and I'd be happy to look for it. And then if I find it, what, about once a month, I do an update and I usually add between 1,000 and 2,000 more entries every month. And uh, if I, you know, if, if it's something I have some time for and I'm interested in, you know, I might, I might abstract 10 more records about your family member. I'd ask you to send me a picture and then the next time we do a refresh, those records will be in here. But uh, thank you. Was, this yeah. is just, you know, this is just kind of a hobby. I do it in my spare time, and uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll do the research, you know, kind of as I have time and interest, and you know, and and if anybody wants to help, then we just, you know, that's how we add content as well. Mark, Mark it's really amazing what you've done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean. Uh, I, what you've done here is an amazing gift to all of us. Yes. I know I, I've, I've used your data to fill out a whole lot of things I didn't know about my family. Uh, at this point, I pretty much understand uh, my four grandparents and their, uh, their journey across mm -hmm. the Atlantic. I'm wondering, uh, and so they, they came in the... Uh, the 1890s through 1905, right? Harcourt. I'm wondering what you might know, share about the journey from their village across Europe to get to La okay. Havre or Liverpool. Okay. Um, okay. What was it like back then? That, that's that's a great question, and uh, there is actually a, a book that was recently written by, by a scholar in the United States about that particular topic. And I'm gonna go in my other room and I'm gonna bring it, I'm gonna show it to you. But let right. me, but, but yeah, but, but that's, that's what this guy wrote about. Hang on just a second. Karen, I think I had mentioned to you that I've got a Masmanian's uh, you know, my family, uh, my grandmother was a Masmanian, and her family gathered in, they came to Boston in Shamet Avenue, which is South Boston. I do remember that, Mark. And yeah. they spread out there. So there were, it was a big clan from the Hartput area. Uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do a stop share here for a second. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Anyway, this, this was the book. Now, are you guys seeing it in reverse order? No, but I, I, well, it's, for me, it's too small to read. Yeah, it's a little small. Hold it closer. Oh, the politics of Armenian migration to North America. Who's the author? I can't really. Yeah, are you seeing it in reverse order here? No, no, no. You're, it's correct. No. Okay, because I'm, I'm seeing it in reverse order. Yeah, it's uh, David E. Gutman. And it's Ed Edinburgh University Press. He just published it like about a year ago. I was, I would listen to him up at Tufts University up there uh, this last year. But anyway, that, that's, that's what he talks about is, is the, the journey that they went through prior to the genocide and, and a lot of the legal obstacles they ran across just trying to get out of the country mm -hmm. and, and, and some of the physical paths that they took. But obviously from Harpeth, you're not going to take a steamship to America, right? <laughs> right. Am I, am I, uh, unless it's unless it's during the flood, but um, yeah. from what uh, I could discern is they didn't have railroads or anything. Um, there were no railroads in the interior. Yeah, right, right. In the interior, yeah. I mean, Erzurum was even more remote, but they didn't have railroads. But what they did is they first they had to get to a seaport somewhere, okay. And if they were in like Eastern Armenia, you know, like Bush, Bush, Beatles, Erzurum. Uh, some of those places, sometimes the, it was easier for them to get to a seacoast on the Black Sea. Okay, so they went, went to uh, Trebizond, and uh, Samsun, or they may have uh, crossed the border and gone through Batum, which is where my grandfather came from, which was on the Russian side. Okay, and then they sailed across the Black Sea. Sometimes they went to Bulgaria or Romania, 
or maybe they went through, you know, past what was then Constantinople and took a ship there. But usually to get from the from anywhere prior to 1915, they didn't take a direct ship from the middle from, mm -hmm. from Turkey to America. You know, they would have had to go through across the Mediterranean, you know, through the Strait of Gibraltar and then across the ocean. They didn't do that until the 1920s. Okay. So what they did is they they somehow they they took multiple leg journey to usually France or England or someplace like that. And then from there took a, took a final ship from, you know, one of the Atlantic ports mm -hmm. to America, but they may have taken, you know, several other ships to get there. Yeah. Uh, they were, were they more likely to take a, 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 a water um, route to, to hop up? To probably. Here? probably. It was probably easier than traveling through the dangerous, you know, Greece and, you know, Hungary and Austria, you know, Austria mm -hmm. and, all these other places. Usually they, a lot of them that, that departed from the French Atlantic ports like Le Havre went yes. to Marseille first. So they sailed across the Mediterranean from, you know, from to Marseille. And then in Marseille, they had all kinds of travel agents down there, what we would call travel agents now who sold, you know, they'd save enough money, you know, like $50 in those times, which was, you know, probably a lot more this time. And then they would buy a steamship ticket through an agent in Marseille. Then they would take a train from Marseille to Paris, and then Paris to one of these Atlantic ports. I see. And then they, you know, which you know was probably a you know week trip by train and all that other stuff. And then that's how they would get there. But after nineteen after nineteen twenty, when they started coming back uh, at, from the refugee camps, and people were sending money to send their bring their family over to America or Canada. Um, then they might have traveled directly from the Middle East. You know, they might have traveled from Alexandria, Egypt, or from Constantinople, or from uh, um, Beirut. They, they had ships that came all the way from Beirut to New York City. Mm -hmm. you know, that was a, that was like a two and a half week trip. Whereas coming from La Havre, France, or Southampton, England, that was about seven days, seven or eight days. But it was not probably not an easy journey. Uh, on the shipment, on the ships, they had three different classes of service. They had uh, first cabin or saloon, which was where the rich people sailed. Then they had kind of a middle tier called second cabin, and then they had a steerage was where ninety percent of the I think ninety one percent of the Armenians traveled in steerage, and steerage was as you you know might expect not very glamorous. So if you if you saw uh, Titanic, which was the same type of steamship as these people were on, it was a little bit bigger, but and brand new. You know, all the the, the poor people traveled in steerage, and then most of our families traveled in steerage. Also interesting how the orphanages travel too, because I know that my grandmother's or um, she was from Curry, and she went she which, which is where my grandfather was from. Yeah, she went to. I don't know if it was a Swiss or Anglican orphanage, mm -hmm. but they, I, she told us that she went to Greece and all kind. And then I, we finally found her passport and it, she, she let, she got her passport in Paris. We yeah. thought she got it in Marseille. I mean, there's, there were all kinds right, of, right. Presents, like you say on that. Did, passport. She come to, did she come to Canada or the United States? She did Hamilton, Ontario. Right. Right. The nice thing about some of the, um, post-war record immigration records it was actually cards from uh, from Canada was they actually said where where did, where did they get their passport from so yeah. you can see you know you can see they came through Paris and got their passport Unbelievable. Hmm. what 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 village were they from in Curie? in Curie? I, yeah. you know I always thought that was the village well Curie was that was the principal town in the casa was same name as Cassaba, but there were about 50 villages surrounding it. All I know is it had berries on a hillside, and she went up on the hillside to pick berries at age six. Mm -hmm. Never came down from that hill. She, yeah. she and her grandmother watched their ma their village get yeah. massacred. Mm. It may have been a village too, but yeah, Arroyan is a very common name I run across in my research of that. that well, area. her name was Pambosian. Yeah, that was her another one. Name, uh, that was, this is my mother's side, not not the Masmanian, uh, Frankian side. But um, yeah. Well, that's right. We and I and I, I, remember, meeting, I remember meeting the two of you when we were down there. 
in, in Brookshire. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we were so fascinated. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had, would have more time to talk then. Yeah. Great. It's really amazing, Mark. What, what a, um, and I think Mark Yagjan said it best. It's really an incredible gift that you've provided yeah, people. Yeah. Yeah. My, when, when we usually about when we weren't having coronavirus, one, at least once a year, we'd go somewhere in the United States and the whole group of us from the Armenian genealogy page and, and talk like we did, we did Watertown Mass, the first one about four years ago. We did LA last year. But when we were at the Watertown Mass thing, I brought my wife and daughter with me. And uh, my wife was out in the audience and I was describing what I was doing and everything like that. And the, this woman next to my wife leaned over and said, you must be a very patient woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a big kick out of that. Yeah, you brought her to Brookshire too, right? Yeah, yeah. They, yes, I brought her to Brookshire. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully, we'll get to come to Texas again sometime when all this mess clears up. Love to have you. But yeah, I'd love to hear from any of you who are who have family that came over in you know the 1930 and earlier that are are trying to find a ship manifest or something. It, it's pretty easy to find them like 1905 and later, the earlier ones are a little bit more difficult because the names are spelled really weird on the, before 1900. You know, sometimes it's very tough to find them. And sometimes it'll just give a name, uh, uh, age, and they're going to New York. You know, mm -hmm. if it's a name like, uh, you know, Bohanesian, you know, you don't know if it's the same person or not. Arroyan's a little bit easier in some of these other ones, but I'd be happy to help you find something like that. And I think if you've got an old photograph, that would be great if we could just add that to the record. Mark, I have one uh, question about the ships. Uh, yeah. I'm curious. I, I, I was surprised that Providence had so many landings. I wasn't aware of that. And my, in my family, I have a, mm -hmm. a story that involves Providence. Would, would a ship have left, let's say Liverpool in my example, and just gone to one port like Providence, or would it have made multiple stops along the East Coast? The ships that left from the Atlantic coast of Western Europe usually stopped at a few places along the way to pick up passengers, but usually they dropped off passengers at, at one port. I see. You know, you know so you'll, you'll find somebody that, you know, they left Piraeus, Greece, which was, you know, kind of fairly near Athens, and they might have stopped in, you know, Sicily, they might have stopped in Marseille, they might have stopped in the Canary Islands, and then they headed across the Atlantic. And But usually once they got across the Atlantic, they stopped in one place. I see, they had a I, full load. Yeah, they, you, yeah, I mean, I have seen a few places where they, you know, where they went to, you know, Providence and they went to New York, but that was fairly rare. I think once they had these people on board for two and a half weeks, they, they were ready, ready to get rid of them. <laughs> now, now, the other thing, on the ship manifest that's interesting is looking at the people that were deported. About 2% of the people were deported prior to 1915, usually because they had uh, some kind of a disease like conjunctive or like a, right, trachoma. Yeah. Conjunctivitis, they let them in, trachoma, they didn't. Okay. Now, when they sent somebody, and, and also if you had somebody that was, uh, uh, had some kind of a medical condition or a disability, or they, they only had one leg or whatever, or they were, weren't able to support themselves, sometimes they sent them back too. So what they did is, you know, they examined them. Sometimes they'd go to a hospital and they said, we're gonna send you back. The shipping company was responsible for, all, for their meals and all the expenses to get them back to the port they left from. Wow. Okay, so the shipping company had the responsibility to make sure that these people met the requirements that the US government put in place. And if they arrived to Ellis Island or whatever, and they said, you know, you don't meet the requirements, they sent them back at the shipping company's expense. Interesting. Many of those people, a month later, they're coming back again and they get in. You know, the trachoma clears up or, you know, maybe the next person that inspects them when they come in a month later, maybe at a different port, you know, says, yeah, yeah you can come on through. Now, my grandfather's story in Providence, just really quick, was that, he was turned away in Providence, mm -hmm. but then he bribed somebody and uh, and jumped ship and got ashore, uh, you know, before the ship ship took him back. 
and then, 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 he, then he avoided his name on any legal documents for the rest of his life. Yeah, and I, I hear a lot of stories like that. Some of them, I actually find them on a ship a, a month later, and, you know, their story was not right other times. And, you know, and from what my dad tells me about my grandfather, he was not a very honest man. And, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why I, when I look at his birth, his age on these things, you know, it swings back and forth 20 different years. Huh. You know, so, I, you know, some well, of these stories, some of these stories are, are true. Some of them are not. You just have to, you know. Sure. Yeah. What would it have cost them to take that voyage across the ocean? Do you have a. It was about, it was about $50 in those, those times. Okay. Yeah. And they were also required to have $50 on them too, or $25 depending on the year. And if they didn't have the money, what they did is they detained them and then they telegraphed whoever they were going to, to send the money for them to uh, take the net, take the thing over the net, you know, the next leg of their journey, journey to Worcester or wherever they were going. But if they, if they detain somebody, at the end of the ship manifest, there's a list called detained aliens, and it has the reason, their name, where they were on the ship, the reason they detained them, and what the resolution was. You know, telegraphed to brother, you know, hold on and, you know, send 50 bucks, whatever. Or, or it said, you know, release to my uncle, so and so. Or sometimes, especially for women and children, it said, release to the Traveler's Aid Agency in New York City. So they were very careful about young women, unaccompanied women and children about just letting them go because I guess so many people were preying on them. So those people, they, they held them until, uh, until a male relative or friend or a sponsor or the Traveler's Aid Society would take them off their hands. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, the ship manifest, especially after 1906, you know, are very interesting and has some really good information on there. Okay, ask now, Dad. Say it again. Mike, was Providence a popular port of entry? Providence was, yeah, one of, one of the most popular ports of entry. And um, in, my, in my query for the report for Ship Manifest, one of the links I have there says, show me all the, all the ports of entry from, from or, or show me where people went to, what the, what the top towns were they went to. Providence was number two besides behind New York City. So New York City was the, was the, the most popular destination for when they first came over. Number two was Providence. Unbelievable. And I think part of the reason for that was when somebody went to Providence, they went to, they went to Providence or East Providence. I've actually combined the two. You know, they might have gone to Central Falls and a couple of these other places. But for the most part, they went to the city of Providence. If they went to Boston, you know, they could have gone to, you know, Cambridge, uh, Watertown, Boston, Worcester, Lawrence, Lowell, you know, there, there's so many different little small places. So that's why, Boston, but if you said the Boston area, that would probably be greater than Providence. But Providence as a, as a unit is, you know, it's just Providence is Providence. But yeah, that was, but in a port of Providence, you know, Boston was very popular, Providence, uh, obviously Ellis Island. Um, you know, then there were some very small ports like Key West, Florida. So people coming from Havana, Cuba went to Key West, Florida. Uh, New Orleans was another port where I think Judy's family, her grandfather came through New Orleans. Um, now, the other thing that people, you know, then obviously you have your Canadian port, ports, uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, St. John, New Brunswick, Quebec, Montreal, and all those. But what people forget about is after the war, World War I ended, uh, you have all these people that, that went east out of, you know, they, they escaped the carnage and went east across Siberia, and then they settled for a few years in Vladivostok or Harbin, China, or one of those places. And those people came to America a different way. They went to uh, Yokohama, Japan, which was the only place they could sail from there to America. And then they went to Hawaii. And then from there, they went either to Seattle or San Francisco. So you see a number of people in 1918, 1919, 1920, taking the Western route wow. and, and, and traveling to one of those places. You know, I, I just think, you know, somebody during the 
genocide, you know, during World War One, you know, crossing over into 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 what was then Russian territory, and then getting caught up in the Russian Revolution, and somehow getting across Siberia, you know, in the mid probably in the middle of winter time, and ending up in you know Vladivostok or Harbin or Yokohama or one of those places, and then going to Honolulu and then you know up to California. I, I just can't imagine what those people must have thought when they landed in uh, in Honolulu and said, "This is where I want to stay." Uh -huh. I was born in Honolulu, so where you? So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's just some amazing, amazing trips these people took to, to finally get to where they were. <coughs> I had a relative that took that route that mm -hmm. from Vladivostok, and yeah. uh, I find it entertaining that he ended up in Lowell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then they took it to trains across the country. Now you're telling me he was at, he could have stopped in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I would have stayed in Hawaii. Yeah, you know, and, and there's some very heartbreaking stories about t people who took that voyage. Uh, I have one of my relatives from my grandfather's village who, you know. He thought his wife and family were killed. Uh, ended up in uh, Vlad or in Vladivostok, and then met a you know this was like 1919 you know four years later uh, married an Armenian woman Vladivostok because he never hadn't heard from his wife and figured she was long gone. Then they went to uh, I think Detroit, and uh, 1920 who shows up on his doorstep the ex-wife. <laughs> And, uh, and he's got a little baby by the new wife there. And so, you know, what, what do you think happened? <laughs> the new wife, the new wife leaves him, leaves the baby with him. And then the old wife raises the new baby as their own child. Okay. Isn't that amazing? I was going to suggest Utah. Yeah, yeah they could have gone to Utah. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, I mean, there's just some amazing stories there these people took. Yeah, and you see some of it reflect it reflected in the records. And you know, when I started this when I was fourteen, you know, like I said, my my dad and you know none of his siblings really knew much about their father or you know any of any. They just knew some of his his nephews and brothers, and uh, you know, so it really wasn't until year you know after corresponding with these guys that I started to hear some of these stories about my own family. And it took me probably five or six years before I ever found it, the village on a map, you know, which Karen probably wasn't very far from where your, your family was from. But, uh, you know, once these records started coming out and I saw the ship manifest and some of these other things, then I started tying together all these loose ends. And I'm still discovering things today. You know, I've, I've got some extended family that, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll meet something like when we did our conference in Detroit, I think it was three years ago, I met some of my cousins there. They, these were do some daughters and sons of these guys who I corresponded with when I was a teenager. And I actually met them for the first time. And then they bring their big photo albums there and show me all these pictures of these family members. You know, my grandfather's mother, I got a picture of her. And I wasn't, I had it for about three or four years before I finally figured out that that was my great grandmother. And I don't know anything about, you know, past that. I, I know my grandfather's parents and that's it. You know, some of you people, you know, I'm jealous that you've got family that you've been able to trace back to the 1700s. And, you know, I can't get past the middle 1800s. But I've got DNA matches with people, you know, the Kagetsis that, uh, you know, that, that match me, you know, DNA third cousins that I don't know how they connect with me. We all have those. Yeah. <laughs> but on my French Canadian side, I can go back, you know, 10, 12 generations. But wow. can't can't do that with the Armenians. No. No. And it's interesting, some of the people that are in the Armenian genealogy Facebook group who are part French Canadian, you know, we, we, we all know how we how we connect, you know, seven or eight generations back on the on the French Canadian side, but on the Armenian side. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Thank. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks, and I love thank to you so much. I, I love to. And so, how many of you actually live in Texas? Thank you so much. My son lives in Texas. Okay. He, yeah. I'm in Minnesota though, but I was in Detroit when I heard you there. 
Okay. I really appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And love to talk with you guys again sometime and send me an email or, uh, you know, whatever, a message. And I'd be happy to, you know, help you with some research on this side of the pond. Okay. Thank Mark, you. you're phenomenal. God yeah. bless you. Thanks, yeah. thanks very much. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you so you much. Too. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you so Good night. much. Stay, stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. 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 <clears throat> Pause recording.